Good morning, participants. So today we are here uh, gathered together to for an international webinar presented by um, senior professor and uh, uh, a scientist. And so I just would like to, I'm, at, I'm Dr. Purnima Devi. I'm the director of One World Hillock Institute of Nature. So here I would like to start with a short presentation about our institute and then uh, uh, Professor, and I'll give an introduction to Professor Dr. Michael Wink, and then we'll uh, hear the lecture of uh, uh, Professor Sir. Okay, let me start. I'm sharing my screen. Please let me know if you could see the, see the screen. My screen is visible, right? If it is not visible, yes. please. Yeah, thank you. Sir. Yes. This is actually, uh, uh, we have started a trust, uh, Nature and Integrated Livelihood Academy. And under the trust, we have started this uh, institute called One World Hillock Institute of Nature. So we have uh, started this institute in order to promote uh, education that is related to nature and environment. So that is why we have kept our slogan as conserve the nature, ensure the eco sustainability. So all our work, all our activities are based on this slogan. And we are uh, here on a mission to protect and conserve uh, the nature, not only protect and protection and conservation, we also focus on reclamation of natural resources. So here, this is our profile and OHIAN is, uh, is, promote, is promoting outreach studies and product-based research that is in the field of natural resources, as I've told you already. So outreach studies in the sense, uh, in, it means that we focus on events, conduct, conducting events, conferences, seminars, symposium, and uh, in order to reach the people uh, outside of the academic uh, activity. So we want to reach the students and other professionals uh, in order to uh, have the awareness on uh, uh, the conservation or awareness on the natural resources and the need of preservation and reclamation of natural resources. So that is why we have taken this outreach education as a main uh, major um, uh, objective of our institute. And uh, uh, we are also focusing on product-based research in the sense we are uh, establishing some facilities with the spirulina, uh, mushroom and vermiculture. So these are organic and natural farming related product based product research, product based research we are focusing and we are trying to build some very good um, um, mechanism or a very good protocol to produce some products that are useful to the society in that is also economical in the way. So we also focus on capacity building initiatives uh, in the uh, in 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 the way that uh, we also um, um, work for tribal empowerment and women empowerment in uh, the Sirmalai Hills in which in where the institute is located. So this Sirmalai uh, Hills is located in uh, Dindical district, which is near to Madurai and uh, Coimbatore and Trichy. The, it, uh, the distance are very near and I will show you how far the, the location is and how far it is easy for you people to reach this institute. And here also we provide not only on offline, uh, this on campus uh, activities, we also provide online activities and we visit your campus and we can train you people, train the students, uh, regard related to your uh, subject of interest. And the working principle that we ha have uh, is me named as FAST. So we focus on intellectual goals and uh, which uh, actually aspires us to think out of the box. So once we find, once we have uh, a thought of uh, creative 
<clears throat> an innovative thought, then we standardize a work plan and that work plan will be focused to develop that into transform that idea into an inventive model. So this is what we are focusing and we have now we have uh, initiated the in the past three to four months, we are working on creating a model uh, or to climb the micro watershed regions, especially in Sirmalai and then keeping taking that as a model, we can implement or replicate the same with the other uh, regions. So these are the area on focus. We focus on biodiversity, climate and energy sciences, agriculture and allied services, eco-educational tourism. This also is taken into concern because this place is very suitable to tourism-like activities and outbound skill development and water resources. So in order to attain these objectives, we have formed a center called Center for Research in Biodiversity and Environment. In this uh, center, we have formed three research hubs. One is uh, Geo360 Geo Hub, in which we focus on geospatial technology related uh, projects. And we are trying to, we have submitted some projects to the ministry and we are waiting for, and we are awaiting funds, but still uh, we have started our background work on that, uh, focusing on the vegetation dynamics and the water resources in Sirmalai. At present, we are focusing on Sirmalai and then we'll extend to the uh, other regions by keeping that as a model, as I've already told you. And here, the next uh, hub is EcoGenTech. This EcoGenTech hub, we actually focus on um, the um, soil uh, um, metagenomics uh, to analyze some soil microbes. And also, we are studying on endophytes for that in order to develop that as a biofertilizer to have a, a new product out of, uh, out of that. And we are also focusing, uh, working on spirulina and uh, vermiculture. So based on that, we are trying to develop some product, products out of these researchers, research, researchers. And then we are working, we are having another hub called Creeper Crawl Entomon Hub. In this, we are studying the sign, uh, the insects in Sirmalai. So uh, at present, we have collected around 60 species and we, are, we have created a gallery out of that. And we are also focusing on leech. Uh, lead study in which uh, we have an uh, um, idea to collaborate uh, with the National University of Singapore. So these research apps, I have given uh, the detailed uh, area in focus, so I don't want to go much in detail, but uh, in GeoHub, we focus, as I told you, we focus on GIS and remote sensing, vegetation monitoring, water and soil analysis, and parameter analysis of spirulina. And these are some of the water analyzer that we have and the mapping, what we do, and the tribal um, uh, day field study that we do. So here in our institute, we always start to go uh, do any project, uh, uh, initiating with the field work and then we take from the we work from the uh, data of the field work uh, we'll take that to the wet lab or the dry lab and then we try to analyze uh, uh, some of the uh, ideas out of it and we work on that so we always want to have a field combined uh, laboratory work and then the Nicogentech lab, we focus on biotechnology and microbiology and plant tissue yeah. culture, especially with the hairy root culture, which is my specialization. And natural farming, as I've told you, that we are focusing on uh, vermiculture and uh, 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 spirulina. And we also focus, uh, try, uh, initiating our uh, um, uh, efforts towards a mushroom cultivation establishment. So these are the ongoing works. We have established a tank, which in a very economical way that can be done by anyone. So we have tried try to establish and we are, uh, uh, it's actually not trying. Now we could establish and we could optimize the conditions now. So we are uh, cultivating it now. And uh, regarding the plant endophytes, we, as I've told you, we are trying to develop some biofertilizer out of it. And then uh, hairy root cultures uh, uh, to produce uh, secondary metabolites or from the herbal plants or from a, um, uh, the economical and medicinally uh, important plants we are focusing. As for now, I, I, I wanted to, I have planned to work with sesame to start with for a uh, phytosterol secretion. So if, which idea has been presented in uh, MSME idea in uh, a hackathon and I'm waiting for approval to start with that. And these are, the, so I just wanted to show how the hairy root cultures looks like. And uh, that is how with the hairy root cultures we can use for phytoremediation, biofuel production and disease resistance. But now we focus on biofertilizers. And uh, uh, regarding to the creeper crawler entomon hub, we have 
we have collected did the field work and this is our lab to the right side you can see the labs and the pictures of our collections uh, down to at the bottom of the slide so this is how the work is being done and we collect and we process and then we store them and we identify them and this is a leech, one of the leech that we have collected now, and we wanted to extend the leech uh, uh, gallery also. And we are trying to isolate around in Sirmalai what are all the insects and the leech species that we have. We wanted to focus on that and to make a data out of it. And we also have uh, focusing on earthworms, and we have collected two earthworms uh, as for now, and we are trying to culture it. And uh, it is multiplying like one uh, baby per day so we could get nine in nine days so out of one mother mother earthworm so we are still studying on that and uh, that is what we have with, uh, about our research and uh, tray internship uh, uh, activities and now we what all the services that is offered from our through our institute is we invite the students, scholars, and research professionals from other institutions and organizations, and even the companies. And uh, they, if they are interested in conservation and protection of biodiversity, natural resources, forest ecosystem, especially because this institute is located in midst of the forest. And we also would like to extend our activities with the climate adaptation studies by using the geospatial technology and the population studies, of course, with the social work department and renewable energy resources with energy science and the geology with the, uh, again, with the GIS and, uh, the GIS and remote sensing technologies. And we also wanted to focus on the study to study on the role of advanced technology and its application in the management, like disaster management of natural resources. We want we are also have an objective to uh, to de develop a device or a simple device out of which is useful to analyze or to um, detect the disaster and help in the disaster management. And this is on the glimpse, uh, glimpse of uh, on what we offer. We offer forest trekking, study tour, and outbound training, short-term courses, short-term projects, internship, and vocational training. We also give entrepreneurship training and uh, seminar conferences, symposiums, and even uh, study or sports camps also we do here. We have a very good ground and a very good facilities. It's a 12-acre campus, and uh, we have a food and accommodation facilities also here. And we also provide internship and uh, the beneficiary departments I've given here, agriculture, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, biology, English, Tamil, even for a philosophy, we uh, offer internships, geography, geoscience, microbiology, social works and zoology. <laughs> and the research areas that we focus on, biodiversity, geography, data science, water and water watershed regions, eco-educational tourism, literature and philosophy. I'm just hurrying up because I don't want the professor to wait. I'm sorry, we can discuss uh, at the end if you want to know more about our institute. And these are the internship topics that we are working on, artificial and data science. There's machine learning especially, and data science and biodiversity studies, DNA and protein analysis, mushroom cultivation, literature and philosophy, this I've already discussed, and spirulina and vermicompost. And these are some of the galleries. This is our uh, main building. And this is a uh, waterman of India, Dr. Rajendra Singh, who is uh, one of the patrons of our institute. And uh, this is a chairman of our institute, uh, Mr. Gurusami. And this is how the field work and field visit being done. And we also provide campfire and we provide some entertainment inside the campus also for the visitors and the participants. And this is our meeting hall. And this as a whole, the participants that they are in. Sorry. So this online internship that we have conducted and again the water analyzer and we have all basic equipments in bio for biotechnology. So these are also insect collection. So inside the campus, it's a 12 acre campus as you see, it's full of trees and so they are catching butterflies inside the campus for their study, my staffs. And this is how the gallery is created. And these are the two earthworms. The one that to the right side is very blue and it's getting fragmented. Actually, we find some different species and we have, we need to analyze whether it's newly 
found or whatever it is we are studying on that. This is how the work has been carried out until now. And we are trying to ex extend our activities. And uh, thank you for listening. And we welcome institutions, organizations, and companies with similar or related objectives to associate and work together. We are always welcome. You can connect me at any time. And uh, our website is www.ohion.org. And today's event, we come to today's event. This is our event, uh, uh, International Webinar on Biodiversity and Healthcare Management. And the first talk is from Professor Dr. Mikhail Wink, uh, Senior Professor and from Institute of Pharmacy and Molecular Biotechnology, Heidelberg University, Germany. And uh, actually, he's my PhD supervisor. And uh, he's a very supportive uh, uh, professor that I've ever met. And it was very nice working in that lab. And he's actually very much experienced. And he has uh, more than 100 PhD students already done. And it's actually crossing the 100 or 120, something like that. And uh, we, are work we, we worked in different uh, areas in that lab, uh, even with the uh, C. elegans and uh, uh, phylogenetic work. And we work with the plant tissue culture and we work with uh, biochemistry, like purification of compound or, uh, and we, they also work with uh, Artemisia, Artemia and different types of work. He always encourages us to go uh, take different, uh, the students with different type of projects. And uh, um, we, we, are, we are very happily engaged in the lab and it, it is a very big lab and we uh, in, enjoy the environment there. And he is a professor very much experienced and he is actually, uh, he finished his Dr. Ernat in pharmaceutical biology and postdoc and habilitation uh, from the Technical University of uh, uh, Braunschweig, Germany. And he served as professor of pharmaceutical biology at the Mainz University, Germany. He served as full professor of pharmaceutical biology and, and uh, director of IPMB, the Institute of Pharmacy and Molecular Biotechnology at Heidelberg University. He served as visiting professor uh, in universities uh, from countries such as uh, Argentina, China, Thailand, and Mexico. Um, including adjunct professor at the Southern Cross University, Australia. And he has in a total of more than 38 years of uh, professional life. He received many awards and the fellowships. He also took part uh, and played an important role in several professional activities, scientific services, communities, etc. He is also a member of several editorial boards and scientific societies. He is editor of Diversity Biotechnology Journal, by Journal of Ornithology and PRJ. He is author of over uh, 20 books and over 700 original peer reviewed publications. He marked scientific excellence in different fields of research, such as biodiversity, biogeography, biotechnology, conservation biology, evolutionary studies, genetics, parasitology plant science, pharmacology, synthetic biology, taxonomy, toxicology, zoology, etc. So to know more about is he, uh, he's like an eminent scientist in his own uh, field and in the variety of, uh, in diversified fields, and he can guide in any, any fields as I've mentioned here. So I'm very happy to welcome uh, Professor uh, Dr. Mikhail Wink uh, to this uh, to our uh, to this event uh, that is conducted by One World Hillock Institute. I'm uh, thank you for accepting to give your talk. You were very generous in accepting and to offer a talk to us. And I'm I'm very much grateful to your. Um, uh, presence here and if to know more about uh, Dr. Professor Wink you can also visit uh, his web, uh, his uh, lab website www.winks-biology.com so so uh, I would like to hand over the session to you sir please uh, uh, take go ahead sir thank you <clears throat> well good morning everybody good morning Punima many thanks for inviting me to be part of this little conference. Also very thankful, I'm very thankful to showing me your big plans about your campus. I wish you good luck. Uh, also, thank you for introducing my person. And as you could see, my interest in science is very broad, but today I will focus more on one aspect, which is related to the work you're doing. I hope you can see my presentation now. Yes, Anima? yes. 
So my title of the talk is Ecosystem Services, Utilization and Production of Plant Secondary Metabolites. So you already realized that secondary metabolites will also play a role in your institution, but I would put it on a more broader scale. So the outline of my talk will be, I start with biodiversity and the challenges which it poses to a scientist. Then I will switch to plants and plant secondary metabolites and their function. And from this, uh, we will discuss the utilization of plants because of their secondary metabolites, like spices, stimulants, and medicinal plants. And medicinal plants will be one of my main topics. I know that's also of interest in India. You have the Ayurveda medicine, which is mostly dealing with medicinal plants. Then I will get a little bit more specific. I will discuss why can we use medicinal plants? What are the modes of action? Can we understand why they are working? And then from this, it leads to the question, if we have valuable secondary metabolites, how can we produce them? And then the final step, how can we even develop a new pharmaceutical product? So this will be the outline of my talk, which will be roughly one hour. Let's start with biodiversity on planet Earth. If we have a tremendous biodiversity. And biodiversity is usually studied by zoologists, by systematicists, and taxonomists by describing species. And the number of described species is less than 2 million, which are living today. There's an estimate that maybe we have more than 10 million, but so most of them are unknown. And most of the unknown organisms are living in soil. There are uh, maybe bacteria, they are small animals or whatever. Because, but most of the higher plants and, anim and higher animals are known. So just give you a rough estimate. Prokaryotes, that means archaea and bacteria, roughly 10,000, maybe have even more. It depends how we define a species. If you come to eukaryotes, there are 240,000 protozoa, although the number can be much higher. When it comes to plants, we have roughly 400,000 plant species, 35,000 spore plants, and 360,000 seed plants. And there we probably have most of the species unknown. If it comes to animals, the biggest groups are outside, the, uh, mostly evertebrates like Lophotrochosaur and Ecdysozoa, that mostly insects and crabs and other things. Whereas when it comes to Deuterostomia, that means the vertebrates, we only have 60,000 species. So that's more or less what we know. And there's still ongoing research today using especially DNA technology, doing sequence analysis to define new species or to reorganize the taxonomic system we have. Overall, it is clear that the biodiversity is changing in the world. It has always been changing. There's always continuous evolution going on. Species are disappearing naturally and new species are coming. But during the last thousands of years, we see that human influence is very strong on planet Earth. There's a lot of human destruction in many ecosystems around the world. It has a strong influence on biodiversity. And biodiversity loss is probably one of the main themes we have today, probably it's even more important than climate change. Because, but it's less discussed because biodiversity loss is going gradually. And normally people don't know what's happening before. But biodiversity is important for us. It's important for science. It's important for humans because we use the biodiversity. And well, in order to be more clearly, ecologists have to define ecosystem services. That means they just listed all the benefits people can obtain from ecosystems. And there are four categories in this case is cultural, supporting, provisioning, and regulating. And in the provisioning area, this is sound here, uh, we have the uh, the area uh, of 
products which can be obtained from ecosystems. This is more or less known, but we still use a lot of raw materials from ecosystems, including lumber, fuel, wood, paperwork, and organic matter, but also rubber, latex, cellulose, tannins, colors, natural pesticides. So this will be raw materials. We also extract food plants from nature, crops, seafood, game, and spices. And spices is a topic which is relevant for us today. The environment also provides us with medicinal resources, including pharmaceuticals, essential oils, test and assay organisms. It also provides us with ornamental resources, quite a lot, and genetic resources. Uh, and this is something which might be important for the future because there are many, many genes outside in living organisms we could be used in a biotechnological context. And in my talk, I will probably most concentrate on plant second metabolites, maybe a topic which you are not really aware of. So therefore, I take some effort to explain it. So that's, so my next topic will be second metabolites, I abbreviated PSM and their function. Well, first of all, let's do a short excursion into plant biochemistry. I know probably not all of you are biologists, maybe not all of you are biochemists. But first of all, like any other organism, we distinguish between primary metabolites and other metabolites. Primary metabolites are sugars, carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, vitamins, hormones. They're essential for life. They are as more or less the same as with plants, as with animals, as with humans. But plants are different. Plants also produce a great diversity of small organic molecules. We call them secondary metabolized or specialized metabolized, metabolites, natural products or phytochemicals. And you see here some of the structures, which are very complicated for the layman. Interestingly, one of the main questions which has only been solved during the last decades is why are plants producing them? Because apparently, if you grow a plant in the laboratory, uh, plants can even live without secondary metabolites. But in nature, it's different. In nature, a plant without secondary metabolites will not survive. And I will discuss this a little bit more. And there's another aspect is, why do we have this great diversity of secondary metabolites with the plant kingdom? Okay, so this is more or less what we'll talk about. We'll talk secondary metabolites. Well, just to shock you a little bit about the diversity of compounds. Overall, more than 100,000 different organic molecules have been identified with modern technology like GLC, HPLC, mass spectrometry, NMR, crystallography. So this is an ongoing area of phytochemistry, which is complicated, but very rewarding because only 20% of all plants have been studied so far. So there's a chance to find more new compounds or just to describe which compounds are present in a given plant. Well, just in order to organize it a little bit, from all these compounds, we can, we can distinguish between molecules which have a nitrogen atom in their structure. Most of them are alkaloids, like here, or nicotine, which you probably know. More than 27,000 different structures have been described. We have known protein amino acids, which resemble protein, proteinogenic amino acids, we have amines, we have cyanogenic glucosides, which release hydro cyanide, and we have glucosinolates, a spicy compound, which uh, also have the uh, free molecules. And then we have all these molecules without nitrogen, especially the terpenoids, monoterpenes, sesquiterpenes, triterpenes, and so on. And we have a big group of phenolic compounds like flavonoids, or antroquinones and others. So there's a bewildering diversity of these compounds in nature. And so this is a challenge itself to study them. Let's now turn to the question, why are plants producing them? That's not obvious. And people for some time thought they were just garbage compounds, but now it's clear plants use them for a lot of purposes, especially of defense. Well, but in order to study them, I would just explain with one example, which I studied myself quite a lot. That's a plant, Lupinus. And from this plant, first of all, 
It contains a series of quinolysine alkaloids. It contains a series of phenolic compounds, especially isoflavonoids. It contains a series of saponines, triterpenes, and some several other compounds. In my own work, I established methodology to extract these compounds, to derive their structures, and then also questions, what are their functions? But before doing this, it's clear that most of these compounds come together in the plant. Even within a group, you usually have more than one compound, you have several. So all these come in big mixtures. And the interesting thing is that these mixtures come from different pathways from primary metabolism, but there's a big variation. So usually the, the mixtures are organ specific. That means the root is different from the leaf, is different from the flower, is different from the seed. We have different differences in development. A young plant is different from an old plant. And we have differences in the population. So if you take thousand different individual plants from different population, you can see some variation in the composition of these mixtures. So this is more or less what we can describe. The question is, what are they doing? The alkaloids are neurotoxins. So they're against all animals, both vertebrates and e-vertebrates. The isoflavonoids, they're hormone-like activity. So they mimic the activity of the female sex hormone estrogen, so they interrupt the, the reproduction. And the saponines are cytotoxic compounds against animals. So one of the function of these metabolites and this mixture is to defend the lupin plants against herbivores, plant-eating animals. But on the other side, plants also have to face the problem of bacterial infection, of fungal infection, of viral infection, and interestingly, some of these compounds are also active in this area, so they have antimicrobial properties. I will come to this later on. So this is the challenge, that we have a group of compounds which are ecologically important and which have pharmacological properties. And one of the questions, why, is plant, why are plants investing in such a diversity? And one of the answers is to avoid resistance of pathogens, to avoid resistance of adapted organisms. And I will come to this a little bit later when we discuss antibiotics. Okay, just to sum up this topic in a more general sense, and this can be done now. So if you ask for the function of second metabolites, uh, and they are around, have been introduced by plants for over 500 million years, so they're optimized compounds. Most of them are used against defense, against herbivores, some of them are also used against microbes, and some of them are also used against competing plants, because some of the compounds producing plants inhibit the germination of other plants. So defense is the main compound, main function. But there's also function as a signal substance. So in flowering insects attract pollinating insects. And to do this, they use colors, which are second metabolites, and they use fragrances, which are usually monoterpenes. But the pollinating insects should be attracted for pollination, but they should not eat the flower or the seeds. In the, in the near range, uh, we have the defense compounds. Also, seed dispersing animals use second metabolites uh, to attract fruit eating animals. They should disperse the seeds. Okay, so this is more or less the signal substances. And also, they have a comp some compounds can be used as UV protection for the plant as nitrogen storage or as antioxidants. Also to discuss this later. So you see, it's a highly complex system, and it seems to be contradictory on the first issue that the same compound can be defense and signal. But if you have a closer look, that is more or less how evolution works. They can try to catch as many flies as possible. I will sum up this part of plant biochemistry, and I call it evolutionary pharmacology because it's different from pharmacology which we use today, because this pharmacology has been driven by evolution, it has been shaped by natural selection. The result is that we have a high diversity of secondary metabolites in plants, which can be used as I will show you later. Because they have to be defense compounds or signal compounds, it means they must be bioactive. And some of the bioactive 
by activities which are shaped during evolution can be used in pharmacology and medicine uh, as in traditional medicine or in modern phytomedicine. And for a cha challenge for a scientist is if we want, we want to understand how do plant second metabolites affect an animal, a microbe. So we're looking for molecular targets, a molecular mode of action. I will show you a little bit later what I mean. Okay, so this is the first part. So we understand already quite a lot. And now let's turn to the point of utilization of plants with second metabolism. This would be ecosystem services. And as you know, humans use spices a lot, especially also you in, in India, you use a lot of spices in order to improve your food, in order to kill bacteria in the food. And most of the spices, the spicy compounds are secondary metabolites. Another implication is in some countries, people use plant compounds as stimulants and hallucinogens, but the most application is medicinal plants. I will discuss this now a little bit more. Well, just to be a little bit more specific, so what sort of plants are we using because of their chemistry? Spices is mostly terpenoids, uh, bitter compounds, uh, aromatic compounds, uh, which, which we use. Also a lot of perfumes, their monoterpenes are used, come from plants, and there they have the function to attract uh, pollinating insects. Well, some of us use stimulants like coffee or tea, uh, in some cultures, plants are still being used a lot because of the hallucinogenic properties. Think of cocaine or, or morphine and others. In the old days, plants were important as a source of poisons to kill animals, but also to kill other people. And they were used as dyes to dye wool and others. Before the synthetic pesticides became available, people used plant pesticides in order to protect the, the, the food plants. Well, most importantly around the world and an application that is still going on today is the use of medicinal plants and isolated active agents from them. I discuss this more. And a new development is the area of nutraceuticals where you take this secondary metabolites of plants and sell them as vitamins, as antioxidants or phytoestrogens. And this is a big market in your country, in Europe, we have a lot of companies which are producing these compounds and make a lot of money with them. Well, now let's turn to medicinal plants. Of the 400,000 plants we have on this uh, planet, about 30,000 plants are known to be used in medicine in some ways. This area of botany is called ethnobotany or traditional medicine. Among the 30,000 plants, 500 plants have been considered to be important on a worldwide scale. And their monographs from the WHO, from ESCOP or HMPC or other monography, monographies. Within these medicinal plants which are used today, we distinguish between plants which have only one molecular target, we call them monotarget drugs. In this case, mostly we have active single compounds which are isolated and used in medicine, but more classically, we have multi-target drugs in which we use extracts from plants, and these are usually used in traditional medicine or in phytotherapy. But basically, <clears throat> as a scientist, we want to understand the mode of action, so we have to distinguish between selective and specific agent. We call them monotarget drugs. This is a classical drug you buy in, in the pharmacy, and there you can do nice structure activity relationships. And we have more non-selective agents. These are multi-target agents, and I will try to show you this is multi-target approach, the traditional approach also works. But whatever we're doing in pharmacology, we have to consider the dose. Only the right dose makes a good medication. If, if, the, medic, if the dose is too low, we have no effect, if the dose is too high, we have toxicity. So there is one area we call the therapeutic window, which is important to find and which is important to discover in all, if you want to use these compounds in medicine. Well, just to remind you of a few compounds which have been used by humans for thousands of years. 
One medicinal plant is Arba somniferum, uh, the poppy plant, which produces alkaloids in the latex, especially from this. From, and from the opium alkaloids, one compound has been isolated, that is morphine. And morphine, this has been used for thousands of years as a painkiller, and it's still used today as a potent analgesic drug. It activates the endorphin receptor, which is important for pain. And there's a hallucinogen derived from a stimulant is heroin. Another compound, which is a multi-million dollar market, are compounds used in cancer therapy. And here the goal is to inhibit the multiplication of cancer cell. There is a drug called vinblastine, isolated from a periwinkle plant, Cataranthus the dimeric indole alkaloid, which inhibit the building up of the spindle apparatus. It inhibits uh, the building up of microtubules. So that's vinblastine and other alkaloids which have been used in the treatment of many cancers. Uh, during the last 30 years, another alkaloid, a diterpid alkaloid, came into the market, Paclitaxel or Taxol, isolated from Taxus baccata and other species, this compound inhibits a disassembly, but the result is more or less the same. Tumor cells will not divide. So this is a real big market, multi-billion market, and it's still interesting to find new compounds which can kill cancer cells. Another area where we need a lot of medication are diseases of the elderly, like Alzheimer's disease and others. And there's also a plant product which makes a lot of money. That's galantamine, which comes from snowdrop galantus. Galantamine is an alkaloid which inhibits acetylcholine esterase, and it's used for symptomatic treatments of people with Alzheimer. Also there, there are many other compounds which have similar properties which could be developed in this area. An old group of compounds which are very poisonous are so-called cardioglucosides, we know the mode of action, they inhibit an important iron pump in the human body, and this iron pump is important for the action of nerves, of muscles. If you inhibit it, uh, an organism will die immediately from a failure of heart and lungs. These cardiac leukocytes occur in many plant families, and they have been used since 200 years in the treatment of heart insufficiency because of this activity. So they are also an important group of compounds. Many of them are still out there. Uh, some of them have been used by mankind as arrow poisons or just as normal poisons. Well, another issue for human health are tropical diseases, parasitic diseases like malaria. And in malaria, a breakthrough came when it was discovered that quinine, an alkaloid from cinchona plants from Southern America, could be used to treat this uh, disease against plasmodium, which is an unicellular organism. A, a breakthrough in this area came a couple of years ago when another compound had been isolated from Artemisia annua. This work had been done in China by Professor Yu Yu Tu, who obtained a Nobel Prize for her discovery. And the discovery here was artemisinin, uh, which is inhibitory for inhibiting the, the growth and multiplication of malaria parasites. From artemisinin, a chemisynthetic substance has been produced, artesunate, which is better bioavailable. Okay, so also this is a big area to find compounds against diseases. And we have many, many infectious diseases around the world, which where we can still find compounds. And usually we look for compounds which have some cytotoxic. So this is the area where we use individual compounds. The wider area, we use complete plants or extracts them. We have them in the European uh, phytotherapy. You have them in the Ayurveda medicine. In China, you have the traditional Chinese medicine. And here the difference is we take an extract from a plant and used an extract which contains hundreds of different compounds to treat diseases. And the question is always, does it work? And I always want to show you a few examples that it works. 
One plant which has been developed in Europe during the last 40 years is St. John's Worth, Hypericum perforatum. It's a plant which is a very powerful antidepressive. So this is on the market today and it is a, is a billion dollar market. It contains basically from the chemistry flavonoids, which are the active agent, but also contains compounds like hypothorin and hypericine. These compounds work together in a synergistic way and they are reuptake inhibitors with a broad activity. That means it improves the conditions of people with depression. The question is always, does it work? There are more than 50 clinical studies being done with St. John's Worth, and I will only show you one. In depressive patients, you look at the increase of the HAMD score, the psychological score over time. And in this case, what people have done, they had hundreds of patients which were treated with hypericum, and another 100 patients were treated with paroxetine, which is a synthetic compound used to treat depression. As you can see, over time, the scores go down from 26 to down to 12. And even the pericum exit was a little bit more active than the paroxetine. So it means it really works. And these clinical studies have shown this. So it's efficative. And the positive side is it has less side effects, less adverse effects, than the synthetic drugs. So this is a drug which is widely used in Europe. Another example, Hawthorne, which only contains phenolic compounds like this catechine, this procyanidine B2. And these compounds occur in the flowers, in the leaves, and in the fruits. And these compounds are also used commercially as a product for patients to treat cardiac insufficiency in the stadium one to three. It's also powerful antioxidant. So also this compound is used in medicine quite a lot and traditionally. And also to show you one clinical study, normally if patients with cardiac insufficiency, they get an ACE inhibitor like captopril. And in this case, with patients with cardiac <coughs> insufficiency, you can easily test them in an ergometer. You just measure how many how strong the heart is. And you can see here, it starts with 84. And after 56 days, it increased to 100 watt. So it means there's a clear improvement of the conditions. And in this case, you see there is no difference between Hawthorne treatment and captopril treatment. So it means apparently those compounds are equivalent in pharmacology, in, in, in efficacy, but again, the side effects are less than in the synthetic drug. So this is just to show you, if you talk about medicinal plants and phytotherapy, it's about a rational medicine which has been tested. Another area uh, where plant secondary metabolites are used are inflammation. And inflammation is one of the common uh, symptoms of many diseases. If also, and the main factor here is an enzyme called cyclooxygenase COX. And if you inhibit it, you inhibit inflammation, you inhibit pain, you inhibit fever. And also here in nature, there is one plant that's this salix plant, the willow plant, which produces salicine, which is converted to salicylic acid. And salicylic acid is an inhibitor of COX. You all know a chemical derivative of salicylic acid that's acetyl salicylic acid, that's aspirin, which you, you probably have been using personally already against some of pains or inflammation. Uh, compounds which are very strong inhibitors of cyclooxygenase are also so-called iridoid glucosides, which are present in many medicinal plants. And here it's a so-called prodrug. If you split off the sugar, then the compounds open and we have a dialdehyde which affect this enzyme. Against inflammation, we also have a group of compounds called sesquiterpene lactones, which have a funny structure with a reactive ring here, and they occur in Arnica and many other species, so they are known to be anti-inflammatory. Well, to sum up a little bit, to give you an idea what sort of diseases can be treated with plant compounds, not all diseases can be treated quite, quite a lot. 
So dementia, dizziness is ginkgo, a Chinese plant. Heart and circulation is crategus and ginkgo. Varicosis is aeschylus and rutin. Psychological disturbances, we have hypericum and many other plants and lemon balm. Respiratory disorders, we have a lot of plants with essential oils, saponins and mucilage, which are working. Gastrointestinal disturbances, tannins, essential oils, liver and gall disorders, milk, sisal and artichoke, lipid disorders, garlic, kidney and urinary tract, direct antimicrobial drugs, brain berry, uh, prostata hyperplasia, we have plants, endocrine disorders, we have plants, immune stimulants, skin and muscles, psoriasis, and um, bacterial diseases, which I'll discuss later. So we have a lot of plants already, and in most instances, these plants have been tested clinically, so we know that it's working, so we have evidence-based medicine. So that's important take-home message. We already know, we are beyond traditional medicine, we already know a little bit more. So this was this part. But now I would quickly address a more academic problem is how, how can we explain that these medicines work? Because as usually the questions a doctor will ask me, say, oh, it's nice that they're working, but can you explain it in a rational terminology? Well, and this is more or less what my laboratory has been doing for many years. So we are looking into the modes of action of compounds in several areas. I don't have to go in details. We're looking cytotoxicity and neurotoxicity in organ uh, discovery. And also lately we are going to study to see, look how many transcription factors are affected by this compound. That means how many genes are turned on or turned off. So that's a very challenging thing. But I would like to sum up the whole thing is, what are the molecular targets and the mechanisms? So this is more in a more simple way. You can make it easier because there are two main, three main targets in any cell, in a human cell, in a bacterial cell. There are proteins, there are biomembrane and the DNA. And if you talk of proteins in the cell, we talk about enzyme transporters, ion channels, receptors, transcription factors which regulate gene expression, signal compass, structural proteins, and the cytoskeleton. So they're in all cells, and they are the main targets of all medical treatment. Because mostly, if you have a disease, something has been going wrong in that area. And if you go into mechanisms, if we have some compounds where we see selective and specific agents, they're binding to receptors or the active site. So this is something the medical people like, so-called monotarget drug, which only affects one. But if you talk about phytotherapy, where we use extracts, we have non-selective agents, which are binding to more than one site and more than one molecule. They're multi-target drugs. And I will discuss later that also these compounds are important. And if you go to the mode of action, we either have covalent uh, bonds with proteins and non-covalent bonds. Well, for, for example, compounds which bind specifically, so that's a selective agent. Here, for example, is a compound, if a biochemistry among you can see it's CAMP, it's binding to the active site of a protein kinase. And we understand now from molecular modeling and also from crystallography that these compounds, they fit into a pocket like a key into a lock. And once they fit into it, we have an induced fit and this induces the activity of the protein kinase. So this is more or less uh, the idea of the specific compounds. Of them we have quite a lot, but not all of the compounds we are using are working by this principle. Uh, an example for compounds which use this principle are those compounds which we call stimulants and hallucinogens, because they mostly bind specifically to neuroreceptors. That means to the receptors for the neurotransmitters. For example, we have ergot alkaloids, a fungal toxin uh, from grasses and, and some cereals. We have mescaline from from a cactus, we have cocaine from a plant, we have morphine, we already discussed this, we have atropine, scopolamine, 
which are abundant in many plants of the families Solanaceae. We have bufotunin, we have muscarine, for example, from mushroom, we have psilocin from mushrooms, we have THC from cannabis, and even alcohol is in this range. So we have a lot of compounds. In this case, we can really understand the mode of action. So they're binding to a neuroreceptor, they either inhibit it or they activate it. And this leads to activation, to stimulations, or to hallucinogenic effects. Compounds which have been used, in, which affect a single target are all mostly isolated now and used as isolated compounds in medicine, like morphine, like codeine, papaverine, ephedrine, quinine, taxol, vinblastine, and many others. So I don't want to go into details. That means we already use a lot of plant biodiversity to extract active compounds and we sell them at chemical entities. So these are all tested and they are part of clinical medicine. Okay, but there's still the other compounds which are occurring in drug, in, in crude extracts. But also here we have mechanisms. And one mechanism is important if we want to affect, and you know, going back to proteins, we have to affect the structure of a protein. We have to change its three-dimensional structure. And one way to do this is to have a compound which can make covalent bonding. So that's something for the chemist among you. If you have a secondary metabolite which has an aldehyde function, it can make a schist bond to any protein to the amino group. If you have an iodine, it can do the same. If you have an epoxide, it can do the same, and so on. So that means we have a lot of reactive chemicals in plants which can make covalent bonds in proteins. And making covalent bonds, it often changes the conformation of proteins, and by this, it changes the bioactivity. There are also other compounds which are non-selective, which are non-covalent bonding. These are, include all the compounds which we call phenolics or tannins. They have phenolic OH groups, and the phenolic OH groups can make iron bonds with charged amino groups of proteins. By this, as we have many of these molecules or these functional groups in a molecule, there's like molecular glue, they can inhibit the, the conformation of proteins, and by this, they can work extremely well. For example, the gallotannin inhibits every protein, every bacteria, every virus. So this is a very powerful protein inhibitor found in many medicinal plants. In addition to the inhibitory composition, we also have antioxidant effect. I come to this later. Okay, so we understand this already. And this is more or less the chemical, the functional explanation why all these things can work. Sum up, many secondary metabolites can change the conformation of proteins that usually is a loss of function, a change of function. And this is important in a medical context because very often you have an overproduction of an enzyme, like an in inflammation, you have an overproduction of COX, you want to inhibit it. And you do this by this sort of principles. So this sort of interaction work, especially uh, in extracts, the, the selectivity is low, but still, as we affect many targets, uh, they still find some activity. So that's important to understand, but still there are many open things to study. Another target are the is the biomembrane, which surrounds every cell, a human cell, a bacterial cell, a fungal cell, and even viruses. <clears throat> and there are also a group of compounds which affect the biomembrane. First of all, all the lipophilic terpenoids, which are produced by many, most plants, but if they get in contact into the body, they usually, they hate water, so they assemble into a lipophilic space, and this would be the inner core of biomembrane. So this is a physical chemical mechanism which takes place. And by assembling in the inner core of biomembrane, they make the membranes leaky or even destroy them. So if you have a concentrated solution of monoterpenes, it works like alcohol. It's a highly strong uh, anti-infective compound. There's also another group of compounds widely distributed in medicinal plants, they're so-called saponins, and the saponins, they can intercalate into biomembrane, they can 
complex cholesterol in biomembrane and they make holes in biomembrane so that membranes become leaky. So that means it kills cells, it kills fungal cells, uh, and even it can dissolve viruses. So that's also an important area which we understand the principle quite well. And also we have all these polyphenols which affect the protein in the biomembrane like transporters, uh, like ion channels or others. So that means the biomembrane is a target for many compounds we have. It's not specific, but it's still an important target. And it turns out that the secondary metabolites which affect the biomembrane, uh, it affects it, cells in a way that metabolites can leak out of cells and cells die. So we have usually apoptosis. And many of the drugs which have these compounds are used for antibacterial activities, especially essential oils, sometimes also polyphenols and antimicrobial peptides, which I discuss a little bit later. Also, we have antifungal activities and antiviral activities. I come to this later as well. So again, we have a big group of compounds here. And as, it, as I told you earlier, plants have to defend themselves against bacteria, viruses in the environment. So they use these compounds, the same principles like we are using in medicine. And DNA is another topic. Also, here we have compounds which can interlate, intercalate DNA to certain alkaloids. And we have compounds which can alkylate DNA. And this usually disrupt the multiplication of cells. But also they're sometimes mutagenic, like compounds which alkylate. So that's another side effect of medicinal drug. So that basically drugs which have these compounds can lead to mutations. They have antiviral activity, antibacterial, antifungal, antiparasitic, and anti-cancer activities. So this is also a very interesting area of research. And many compounds we have in the Indian or the Chinese flora have these properties. Now I would like to come to another topic which is important if you talk about plant activity and plant second metabolites and medicinal plants, this is the use of antioxidants. Well, I have to explain a little bit more. The base is that in the metabolism of a cell, reactive oxygen species, so-called ROS, are being generated. They can, so this is oxygen and there's several derivatives like peroxide, hydroxyl radical, hydroxyl ion, and so on. These compounds are generated in the human body and they can oxidize membrane lipids, they can um, oxidize glutathione, they can oxidize proteins, and more importantly, it can oxidize DNA and discuss it later. The body has defense systems like superoxidismutase, glutathione peroxidase, and catalase, but sometimes the body needs more help if you have too many of these compounds. Because <clears throat> too many of these compounds can occur, that means oxidative stress, if we are exposed to UV light, if we are exposed to ionizing radiation, if we start smoking, air pollution, uh, and also inflammation, pain, and stress, they all increase the concentration of free radicals. And the free radicals in the body, as I showed you later, they can influence membrane lipids, uh, proteins, but more importantly, they can influence the DNA. And this sometimes is usually not really explained, because what does they do? For example, if they have the DNA-based guanosine with ROS, you oxidize this and you end up with 8-oxoguanine. And 8-oxoguanine no longer pairs with cytosine, which do with which guanosine do, but with adenosine. So that introduces uh, mutations, and this introduce can even lead to cancer. So what we know at the moment already that free radicals, overdose of free radicals can lead to infections, arteriosclerosis, heart and vascular disorder, disorders, cancer, and aging. And there is where our medicinal plants come in. And I think this is one of the most interesting area now in the development because many plants produce antioxidants and antioxidant inactivate the ROS. And by this, they help the body as prevention against cancer, against also other diseases. And the antioxidant compounds we're talking about are polyphenols, carotenoids, chlorophyll, even this, mustard oils, they have antioxidant properties. 
We know from our work with the elegans that polyphenols, methosanthines, chlorophyll, and mustard oils enhance longevity of animals, maybe also in humans. Polyphenols and other compounds can work against neurodegeneration, like morbus Alzheimer, Parkinson, and Huntington, at least in animal models. So that means apparently the antioxidants are very important. Just to remind you, you're using antioxidants in your food every day. We have a lot of berries, blueberries, red berries, like blueberry, arona. Uh, we drink coffee, chocolate, we eat ginger, curcuma, and apples. They all contain polyphenols, which are strong antioxidants. We have lipophilic antioxidants, like carotenoids, from tomato, from pepper, from melons, and carrots. And we have other antioxidants, like onions and garlic, with vitamin C from citrus, mustard oils, chlorophyll. All of them are traditional ingredients of our food. They're also ingredients of, of nutraceuticals, and they are the traditional way to counteract all these diseases. And the important issue is you have to take them daily. You have to take a high dose in order to be effective. So I think also this is an important area which needs to be studied in more detail. Well, I would quickly address a final topic these are more or less the antimicrobial, antiviral effects of plant sacrum metabolites. Also, this is an area which is medically extremely important. As you know, humans have been challenged by pathogens like bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites since we existed. In the old days, our ancestors only had plant extracts with antimicrobial activity to treat infections. There was only a change in the middle of the 20th century when the antibiotics were developed. So the antibiotics are mostly monotarget drugs which can inhibit the multiplication of bacteria. They're specific. But unfortunately, and because we were only treating with a single compound, a lot of resistant bacteria have been developed. And now a big challenge for medicine is that many of the pathogens now antibiotic resistant. So we need new antibiotics or maybe we need to have new strategies uh, to overcome antibiotic resistance. I will explain you a little one which we studied in our lab. So new compounds is one. Another comp strategy would be combinations of active agents, not using a single one, but combining, for example, combining antibiotics with antimicrobial second metabolites which attack a different target, and I'll show you how it can work. Well, just to see, think about targets, we discussed the targets in animal cells. In a bacterial cell, the targets are less diverse. We have a cell wall, we have a biomembrane, we have the ribosomes, we have the DNA. And also here, we can affect the targets. Traditional antibiotics go on the cell, on the cell wall, like penicillins. We have compounds that go on the ribosomes. But most of the compounds don't attack the biomembrane, which is the target for many plant compounds. Just to give you an idea, there are many, many secondary metabolites which have antimicrobial activities, especially uh, terpenoids. In one of the studies, what we were doing is we were using and making combination of a, of an, a benzyl iotis thiocyanide big it comes from brassica species, and we have a monoterpene carbacrol, very similar to thymol. So what you do in microbiology, you determine the minimum inhibitory concentration and the minimum bactericidal concentration, called MIC or MBC. And for example, if you only take the benzyl as a thiocyanide, it here are different bacteria. Most of them are pathogens. You can see is big alone, has some activity, but it's not very strong. Carvacrol is much stronger. So it's in the microgram range for the activity. But if you take a real antibiotic like vancomycin or streptomycin, it's more active. So apparently these things work, but you need a high dose to have a, a, a strong effect. And now we found out that some, if you start to combine the two drugs. In this case, we're combining carvacrol, the bit, and streptomycin in E. coli and, every, and several others. And what we do is a so-called time-kill curve where we 
in incubate the bacteria with this compound or the combinations and then take an aliquot, plate it, and measure the number of colonies which are still alive. So this would be the control uh, without any treatment uh, or with carvacrols, we see some effect, but it really doesn't kill. If you take streptomycin alone, it reduces. But the moment you start combining streptomycins with caryof with carvacrol, you have a very strong effect. If you combine streptomycins with benzyl tyosinite, you have a very strong effect. And even if you combine uh, the carvacrol with benzyl tyosinite, you kill all of them. So that means combinations of compounds can be extremely powerful. And we have done several studies with two combinations or three combinations, and they work against a lot of the multi-resistant bacteria. But that's good news. So we have a possibility, but we need to do it more cleverly. Another example is an alkaloid uh, that sanguinarine, also present in many medicinal plants, is a DNA intercalator. Also, this compound is one of the strongest plant antibiotics I have known. So if you see here the MIC value, they are in the microgram, one microgram range for many compounds here, uh, or the MBC is very low, and it's sometimes even lower than the MBC for streptomycin alone. So that means the sanguinarine is a fantastic antibiotic drug. We also have done studies to combine the sanguinarine with antibiotics, and the effect was even stronger. And here in red, these are multi-resistant uh, bacterial strains. Also, they can be killed by this compound and also by combinations. So apparently, we have a possibility to deal with a big challenge in, in, in medicine. Another possibility is to use a different class of secondary metabolites, they're called so-called antibacterial peptides. They're small peptides which make membranes leaky. They have a broad activity against bacteria, fungus, and viruses. So also we started some work on these compounds, and I only want to show you a few examples. For example, an AMP from Impatien, the plant. So we produced it by, by technology as recombinant bacteria, recombinant peptides. So they work against a high amount of different bacteria, also the resistant bacteria. So they have a good activity. And the nice effect is that they work quickly. Whereas vancomycin kills bacteria in 20 hours, these antimacrial peptides are killed within one hour or even within 10 minutes. So that means if we need some for the for septicemia, where we need immediate response, probably these antimicrobial peptides are a solution. They are peptides, so we can use them using DNA technology. And we have done this. And we also used plant tissue cultures. We also used root culture. The Ponema may remember. There's also one compound, which is the last example is of an AMP, is this ranalexin, which occurs in the skin of frogs. Uh, is also a peptide, which has very strong antimicrobial activities. In this case, one of my PhD students started to do some chemical studies. So we made these compounds by chemical synthesis, and we added some different components to the compound and looked at the activity. And this is more or less what we could show is that we have new derivatives, which were more active than the original one. So that means with some engineering, we can produce even stronger peptides. And also some of the peptides, importantly, we could improve the bioavailability. The original one is immediately cleaved from the body. But if we have different varieties, we have one which stay longer in the, in the body, so they are longer available. OK. So the last to topic I would like to discuss is antiviral compounds, because with cause of SARS-CoV-2, the question is, can we do something with plant material? This is a typical virus. We have a membrane, a biomembrane. We have the DNA or RNA and nucleocapsid, and we have proteins on the outside. Well, as you know, at SARS-CoV-2, and unfortunately, most of the Virologists had no idea about plants and plant chemistry, so they only wanted to have some vaccines. But we know from plant chemistry that we also have a lot of compounds which can really interfere with, with viruses. For example, 
We have essential oils, which can interfere with the biomembrane of viruses. They can kill them if they are still free. We have polyphenols, which attack the spike protein and other proteins. So all the polyphenols and essential oils kill even SARS-CoV-2. So they could be effective. Maybe if the patient is already ill, he, they could gurgle with a solution and could reduce the, the overall load of these compounds. Once the viruses are in the cell, it's more complicated. But here you can use DNA intercalating substances like the sanguinarine, and it could be shown in cell cultures that even viral replication could be more or less inhibited. So well, the take home message is, it's important also to look into medicinal plants and medicinal chemistry in order to fight viral diseases. Unfortunately, this is a field completely neglected by clinicians and especially by virologists because they don't understand plant at all. Okay, summing up a little bit. So we have discussed that we have mixtures in plants which are composed by different secondary metabolites. And if we look into the question is, are all these compounds work individually or do we have additive or even synergistic, synergistic interactions? That means, do they uh, work together and have a stronger effect? We already know that saponins, terpenoids, and other lipophilic met metabolites interfere on biomembranes. Phenols and secondary metabolites with reactive groups, they go on proteins or on DNA. And if you have a multi-component mixture, very often, in an extract, we affect all three major molecular targets in a bacterial cell or in a human cell. And one of the big principles in proteins, as I discussed, is the conformational change. Okay, so we already understand this a little bit. The question is, well, what about interactions? Uh, can there be synergistic effects? And also there, I would only briefly show a few when. We have some polar secondary metabolites, which cannot diffuse into the cell, but there are some other compounds in the extract, which are uptake facilitators. I will show you later, these are probably saponins. So that means the moment you have a facilitator, you can take up a polar component and you can interact with molecular targets in the cell. So this is one extremely interesting area. Another area is many cells have ATP transporters, which pump out lipophilic compounds which enter the cell. And very often we have secondary metabolites which can inhibit these transporters. Also doing this, we can also increase the activity. And also the metabolic inactivation, like the SIP system, can be inhibited by secondary metabolites. So that means we have evidence that the synergies exist. I only want to show you one example, which pre pretty clearly shows how it works. In this case, People were making an extract from agrostemma and studied the cytotoxicity in EC leaf cells. The water extract from the seeds has some cytotic, cytotoxic activity. When they put extracted the seeds, they have an area with saponins, and the saponins are active at an IC50 of 10 microgram per mil. And there's also a lectin, a protein, in that which is inactive alone, but the protein is active when it comes into the cell. The moment you combine a little bit of saponins and the lactin, you have a very strong cytotoxic effect. So in this case, the, the agrostemma saponin is a facilitator for the peptide to go into the cell and then inhibits protein biosynthesis. So this sort of interactions are very interesting and exciting. So this is a real challenge to understand them. It's not easy, but as to my mind, we have to understand synergistic interactions in these extracts we have in medicinal plants are of importance. Just to sum up this part, I hope I can show you that phytomedicine is not a placebo medicine. It's a medicine which has been developed during mil millions of years. It's a medicine where we understand the targets and others, and so that means it's a rational medicine. So let's come to the last part of my talk. Well, once we have identified compounds which are of interest, the question is also how can we produce them? One possibility is uh, 
or the traditional way, we still have a plant, we make an extract, we isolate active components, or we use the extract immediately and we use them medically as a nutraceutical, as a perfume, or a biorational pesticide. There's still a challenge for the future is that we use plants and to improve uh, the yield of second metabolites by inducing metabolism or by stimulate metabolism, or if we introduce new genes into a plant to have different varieties. So this is a challenge for biotechnology. Well, the so traditional way for most of the compounds I talked in medicinal plants is they've been harvested in the wild, but this is not sustainable. So more and more, the main medicinal plants are being grown by farmers like Yevisa pericum. So there are implantations and there are a lot of special farmers around the world which make a lot of money by concentrating on the important medicinal plants. And for the plant breeders also here, there's a big goal, a big aim is to improve yield and quality in the variety. So also this is a room for improvement which might also be interesting for your institute. Well, this is more or less how it's been done traditionally and this is things mostly successful. Still, as we talk about by, uh, cell and organ cultures, there's also a possibility <clears throat> to use plant cell and organ culture to produce secondary metabolites of interest. Uh, Ponima already explained her interest in root cultures. You maybe you remember that we have been working on it for some time. For secondary metabolites, it turned out the cell suspension culture are not so good because metabolism is deregulated. But the moment you turn to root culture and shoot culture, we have a lot of metabolites being produced. At one stage, we even had a company, RootTech, where we were growing roots, and this is growing root in a fermenter. And in this case, we use these root cultures to produce an anti-cancer drug, come to TC. Uh, it could be used continuously, good yields. So that was a real success story. But unfortunately, the industry did not buy the patents. So that's still a big challenge and it still works and it also can be used to express proteins genes uh, for this is this called farming uh, uh, which is also an interesting application of root culture to produce proteins which are of medical interest uh, so this is something uh, ponima did, did a phd on so this is one area which is interesting which can be done in every lab it's not very expensive and it's very, it works. But still, anyhow, if you have plant cell organ cultures, you still have to downstream processing and you have your product. There's an alternative now is genetic engineering of pathways, because the moment you know a pathway leading to a second metabolite, you can isolate the genes of the pathway, co-express them in bacteria or yeast and produce them. So in the long run, the hope is that fermentation of second metabolites in the bioreactor. And this is being done at the moment in the laboratory. And there are many pathways already, like for example, is a quinoline alkaloid leading to morphine. Most of the pathways, the genes are known and have been already expressed. So this is an ongoing thing. At the moment, the yields are still too low, but I'm pretty sure maybe in 10 years time, uh, at least some of the compounds will be completely done by fermentation. So this is a real challenge for the long term. Okay, so this was production. And let's be turn to the last point is, well, one goal of any academic is to produce products which are useful for the society. We can either use traditional knowledge of plants, which have been orally transmissed, transmitted, or we use pharmacopoeia to, to isolate, to identify plants of interest. Another area which is doing done today is, is bioprotection, bioprospection and drug discovery academically. So we look for active compounds and we look for new applications. And the goal is to have nutraceuticals. We have no health claims, but it's either marketed. We have traditional medicine, which is regulated by biologicals, the F, regulated by the FDA, and we have registered and applied drugs by the European uh, Medicinal Agency. So there's more or less a 
go and if you have this compound, you can go on the market. But there's some restriction in Europe, there's normal food, there's, but anyhow, whatever you do, you have quality control, uh, GLP, GMP, and you have to control for mycotoxin and toxic alkaloids. So overall, this is the way, but you still need a lot of money to be successful. Just to give you an idea, if you want to go from, if maybe you're successful in the lab, you have an active agent, uh, and you want to develop it into a drug, uh, you have to do some clinical testing. It usually takes up to nine years, and it's divided into four stages. One is the preclinical stage, then phase one, phase two, phase three. And in each stage, you have different tasks to follow. In the first preclinical stage, stage, you just check for activity for pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics. In phase two, you have clinical studies with healthy patients. In phase two, phase one, in phase two, you have uh, patients with, with, with the disease and you see for true for efficacy. In phase three, you have a large scale study and you look for side effects and see if it works. Okay, so all of all together, companies say it costs more than 200 million euro to develop a new drug today. So it's high cost. And pharmaceutical companies, and now comes the, the little bit the negative side. They usually ask, if you go to a company, you say, we need a patent. Do you have a patent for your product? As with plant natural compounds, you can't get a patent. You can only for a derivative, but you can get a patent for the extraction. So if you have no patent, usually the plant, the pharmaceutical company say, sorry, we are not interested. So another thing is then in these big pharmaceutical companies, we have economies now, and the economists say we only develop drugs for uh, diseases which make money. These are usually chronic health disorders that are vascular diseases, heart conditions, diabetes, and cancer. So if you come with, say, antimicrobial stuff, they say no interest. Okay, that is one of the concepts why we have very few plants which have been added to the market recently. Unfortunately, but there may be a change in the future, especially with antibiotic resistant stuff, where we probably need this plant metabolites to conquer it. By this, I come to an end. Uh, uh, I have you took, I took you on a field trip from biodiversity. And I could show you that biodiversity is important for humans, for human health, because they have secondary metabolites which develop your evolution, and we can use them in a rational way. So this is a, a challenging area where we can combine biodiversity, medicine, and applications. By this, I come to an end, and I should show you one picture of the lab taken some years ago. Uh, and many, as you can imagine, many of the things I was talking about have been developed by people doing a PhD with me. I also have published a few books on medicinal plants of the world, on mind-altering plants of the world, and herbal drugs and biotechnology. So if you have more interest, have a look. But this, thank you for attention, and I'm happy to take your questions. Bonima, yes. Esso, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think there are no more questions from the participants. I would like to introduce you to our visiting faculty from Madurai Kamaraj University. Yes. His name is yes. Kandadasan. So, so I think he wanted to present something. Uh, if you have time, we can do yeah, it. Yeah, time. Yes, I can listen. Yes, yeah. thank you. Please, thank you. Thank you. One minute. So actually, we are collaborated uh, to do work with in geo uh, in integrated with geospatial technology. So we do we study the vegetation dynamics and water resources. share my screen. Yeah. 
Good afternoon. So I am going to say about a little bit information about uh, geospatial technology. So uh, this is a combination of uh, both uh, GIS, uh, remote sensing, and then GPS. So we are call it as a uh, geospatial technologies. Uh, so as we know that uh, remote sensing uh, is method of uh, information getting without a uh, physical contact. So based on this, uh, so many satellites is available on a geostationary satellite and then uh, polar orbiting uh, satellites. These are the common elements of remote sensing, energy source or elimination, uh, radiation and then uh, atmosphere interaction with the target, recording of energy by the sensor, uh, transmission, uh, reception and the processing. So the feature, uh, uh, this, uh, this is a base station. And then this is a solar uh, energy. Here is the energy source is the solar. The radiation is comes from the solar energy. Then when the hitting on the object, that will be reflected on the uh, satellite. Then that satellite is observed whether it is a what kind of uh, feature is available. So then that will be transferred to the uh, 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 station, base station, and we will uh, get the data. So this is the electromagnetic uh, spectrum uh, for a 0.4 micrometer to 0.7 micrometer range. We are uh, this is a visible spectrum. So here I have uh, given some of the remotely sensitive data for uh, the sat uh, satellite and the aircraft. So some of uh, data given here. Then this is some of satellite picture is uh, taken from the satellites. Some of the sensor, even a human eye is one of, uh, you know, sensor and then air. So like that, the satellite, what kind of cameras uh, they are used, uh, that is, we call it as uh, sensors. So the sensors is uh, uh, differentiate from the what kind of purpose we are launched to the satellite for the whether uh, earth observation or ocean observation. So what kind of a facility they are uh, included. So the cameras will be changed. So this is some of uh, history of uh, remote sensing. So first, uh, the 18th, uh, 1858, they are uh, taking the photograph from the balloon. And then later on, the pigeon cameras, sky photography, and then the World War first and second, they are used for the aircraft. And then later, 1947, uh, they are used on the space, like uh, satellites. So this is a very common uh, thing for uh, remote sensing is uh, mission plan and the choice of sensor. So as I said earlier, because of what kind of uh, uh, plan we are choose, uh, like that we can uh, choose on the sensors. So reception, recording, and then processing of the signal data, what kind of signal, suppose on the forest area that will be reflected and the, some, some kind of uh, signals. Suppose on a built up area that having the, some kind of uh, signals. And then water body having the, some absorption. That is based on the absorption and then uh, reflection. So based on that, we can identify the whether it is what kind of a feature is available. So then uh, we could uh, analyze the what kind of result we are expecting from that uh, satellite image. So these are all the some fundamental terms about uh, resolution. So spatial resolution, then spectral, radiometric, temporal, and then radiometric resolutions. So this is uh, some of uh, satellites uh, like NOVA, that is uh, uh, 1100 meter for the one pixel. This uh, information is based on the what accuracy is having the satellite image. So Geo's mode is Landsat uh, and then uh, Indian product of uh, IRS. They are having the four uh, series of uh, list uh, one, two, three, four. So list four is recently we are using an uh, for our studies, because if that is a 5.8 meter resolution, we can identify the so much of a feature easily. Then Icnos and then QuickBed, one of Google Earth, they are uh, using an uh, uh, image is a 0 0.6 meter resolution, it's a QuickBed. So 0 0.5 meter resolution, we can identify the even the single tree uh, and then even the buildings for our uh, study purpose. So this is some of our satellites from, this is uh, taken from the Landsat uh, thematic mapper. It's a false color composite. 
So here we can having this different uh, colors. So red colors is, is indicating the crop lands. That's like uh, what are the uh, agriculture land or vegetation or whatever it is. Here we come to know that the square and the rectangle pattern is showing like uh, agriculture land. Maybe they are uh, uh, cultivating and they, uh, some of the plants. So if it is agri, uh, uh, suppose the resolution is high, you can identify what kind of uh, uh, agriculture activity or what kind of plant is planted. So here having the sum of uh, you know uh, built up area, built up areas comes under the maybe settlements, residential area, or industrial area. So these information we are uh, going to uh, analyze as based on the accuracy of uh, satellite data. Here uh, this is one of uh, spot image. See the Washington uh, data, uh, Washington USA, uh, this taken from the 2002. We can identify the feature. See, this is uh, buildings. So the, the buildings uh, shadows is uh, having a uh, black color. So we can analyze the height of the building also. And this is uh, one of a quick bed uh, image. So same kind of... Uh, uh, area suppose on a higher area is uh, maybe uh, flowers flower cultivation can uh, see the water bodies on here and then icnus uh, data this is a panchromatic so this is look like a uh, black and white color so uh, we come to know that uh, this is an uh, stadium the stadium is a higher uh, uh, you know uh, stays here the shadow of uh, the stays you can able to see here. And then some of the car parking area, you can identify the cars also. Then some of the applications, so we can apply with the uh, urban and then uh, regional planning. See the two different uh, years of data we need to collect. And then uh, this is a previous, and then this is a recent uh, area. So how much area is occupied for the Urban, we can uh, identify with that uh, uh, reflections and then uh, agriculture, can you use it and what kind of agriculture they are doing. And then this is a flood damage for uh, how much area is affected uh, for the within uh, dur uh, during the flood time. So we need to get uh, before flood satellite image and then after flood. Then only we can uh, able to say the how much area square kilometer is affected by, by the flood. And then we can say the possibilities uh, for affecting the uh, flood also. And then this is a uh, coastal resources. So here uh, now we are doing uh, the coastal erosion and then accretion mapping. And then uh, where it is needed to construct the uh, coastal walls because of uh, affecting and the tidal forces. So the problematic area we are identifying. So this kind of uh, work we are uh, doing. So another one is important thing is uh, land use land cover, how much of land and which uh, purpose they are used and then uh, where it is expansion of urban area, what is the uh, sources of expanding urban or agriculture. So nowadays uh, agriculture is reducing. So what is the reason for behind that? Uh, so the agriculture lands may be uh, converted to a uh, other area or uh, uh, agricultural land become a built-up area, so become a fa fallow land. So what is the reason that we are analyzing with the satellite data? And then uh, another one is uh, geographic information system. We can apply with this uh, uh, GIS for any kind of activities. What we are thinking on your mind, we can apply with uh, anything and create the maps. So GIS is a geographic information system. So why need to be are used? Because of much work as in uh, uh, infinite spatial na nature. So we need not to explain the text part of uh, things for the, what is happening in the global. So single map can define the you know much more uh, information. So this is uh, some of the definitions. So I need to collect the uh, collection, maintenance, storage, analyze, output, and then distribution of spatial data. So this is the important five key components of GIS. One is the hardware, uh, what kind of uh, hardware means uh, maybe even computer system, what we are used, and then softwares, data, people, and then method. 
So here this is uh, some basic framework of GIS. So spatial data is analyzed with the computer hardware, mapping software, presentation, modeling, and storage data output, and then uh, personals. Uh, the three basic elements of a GIS, the earth surface feature we are uh, showing on the maps, the points, lines, and then polygon. Suppose on the larger area, suppose on covered by the one of district more than uh, 100 square kilometers of the area, if we can show the buildings and the polygons, even suppose uh, points and then uh, polygons, and then uh, road network and railway network, and then um, natural water bodies, what are the things is possible to show on the line features? You can show the lines, and then polygons is water body, forest area, natural, larger area, we are showing in the polygons. So, from the data, what we are going to be analyzed, whether it is a possible to show on the points or lines in the area. So it's based on the accuracy and then uh, area of uh, study, what kind of area we are choose. Okay, this is some of the data sources. The satellite image is one of the data sources for uh, planning and maps. And then paper file, suppose we are uh, going to collect and the questionnaire from the people, we can add it the attribute from the what kind of uh, map we are uh, producing. Uh, means personal interview on the field survey, uh, remote sensing data. Some of us, uh, government of India, they are producing a survey of India topographical sheet. So there is a, one, a scale is one is to 25,000, 50,000, and then uh, 250,000. What kind of scale data we are used? So that kind of result uh, is possible to show on the maps. So this is some of applications, the variety of applications is possible, network analysis. So suppose on network analysis, what is the shortest path of going to reach and the destinations? So whether it is a, we are in a accidental ground zone area, so where we are going to be found on the hospitals. So what is the shortest path of that? So these kind of things, so incident mapping, spatial measurement, uh, so, so many things is possible. And then this is urban planning, uh, existing condition, and then current plan, and then what is the alternative plans of uh, urban. So some of application is like a soil map, and then ground bottle uh, prospects, and then uh, suitable sites. Suppose uh, the suitable sites is uh, different, uh, suitable sites for waste deposit. Uh, this is one of a study, even the every urban area having the uh, very big problem for the waste deposit uh, dumping land. So what is the best land? And then rainfall map. Suppose we receiving the data from the rainfall stations and then spatially how it's possible to show on the maps. Suppose on, on Talik, we have a three rainfall stations from here, here, and here. What is the uh, range of uh, rainfall is receiving in particular place? This is an interpolation method having an uh, ArcGIS uh, software. So this is a one of a model for uh, crime analysis where, where it is available on the police station. Uh, what are the crime event is possible to uh, happen on uh, here? So the, what are the routes and then intersections, uh, interstates? Uh, everything we can show on the maps. So this is a traffic impact result component uh, that is based on the environmental impact assessment. So once in uh, traffic signals, suppose on 90 seconds or 180 seconds, what kind of uh, uh, emittance is possible, how it is affected on the environmental. So this is a map. <clears throat> and then this is a, uh, the urban area. So where it is developed, the urban area, the current scenario. And then uh, even a future prediction, what kind of uh, urban area is possible to extend. So we can show that the uses of uh, satellite image. And then this is one of interpolation method. The interpolation method, we can possible to adapt with the rainfall and then uh, water level and then water quality of uh, these maps. So these are all the stations where we are collected the water samples. So water samples so is basically, we, we come to know that uh, pH and then uh, TDS, so, so many parameters. So all the parameters, how uh, is showing on the maps. So uh, the interpolation method is only we are getting the information from the samples. And then based on the samples, we can do the uh, the maps. 
So suppose on the, the number is 23, uh, what uh, uh, the both station of uh, average uh, ratio uh, will be showing on uh, here. And then uh, digital elevation model, we can make it for uh, 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 based on the radar data. So radar data is uh, having uh, the relief data, the relief data showing the uh, 3D uh, model based on the interpolation and then DEM data. So another one uh, paper was published uh, is based on the water quality. So this is my study area. And Tamil Nadu, Tiruvannamalai district. So we are collected the water level sample as well as water quality samples. So each and every month and then season wise. So what is the level? Suppose on the, you see here uh, from the month of uh, May, we can show the uh, depth of water level. And then uh, even the monsoon season, we have the higher uh, rainfall and then uh, water level automatically is increased. So the water level fluctuation is based on the, these data. We are created uh, uh, the maps with the uh, help of a GIS. So this is a fluctuation that is some meters. So, our second uh, speaker is Dr. Kiran Kumar Bali. So, he is a senior scientist in Heidelberg University, Germany. He finished his doctor, doctorate in humanistic science in pharmacology at Heidelberg University, Germany, and was Master of Science in Life Sciences at Pondicherry University in India. He has professional experience as a senior scientist and visiting scientist at the University Hospital Heidelberg and European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Monterantaro, Italy, respectively. He also served as an invited speaker at renowned institutions in the USA, Canada, and India, invited faculty at international conferences in Sweden and Ireland, and was invited moderator for invited to as a moderator for webinars conducted by the IASP Paying Research Forum. He is also a member of different international scientific associations. At present, he is working as a senior scientist at Heidelberg University and functions as an advisor to the European Federation of IASP chapters, Brussels, an editor and ad hoc reviewer for several international scientific journals of high repute. Through his 18 years of professional life, he studied innovative RNA-mediated disease mechanisms and identified several RNAs as novel therapeutic targets for the treatment of chronic pain. He has published several scientific articles in international peer-reviewed journals. He has several years of experience in building and leading research teams, supervising personnel of varying levels of education and international stakeholder management. He has several awards and certifications to his credit and excellence fellowship from the Medical Faculty of Heidelberg University, several tra travel grants to present his work at international conferences, the Mo Max von Frey Award from the German Pain Society, Raising Stars Grant from the o Ono Pharmaceutical Co, Co Limited Japan, and Type 2 Innovation Grant from the Sanofi Gen Genzyme France are few to name. His current few focus areas include reducing disease burden by bringing his scientific discoveries close to the patients. He is especially committed to adapting his expertise to developing a sustainable ecosystem and training the young generation in state-of-the-art research infrastructure. So I'm happy to welcome Dr. Kiran Kumar Bali, who is a very good friend of mine. And uh, thank you, Kiran, for your time here. And I, uh, I welcome you to start your uh, lecture today. Thank you. I hand over the session to you. Thank you very much, uh, Purnima, for your nice introduction. It's my pleasure to be here to interact with you and uh, all the participants here. I will try to uh, 
present uh, what I can. <laughs> Obviously, I can't do more than what I can. So before uh, starting the presentation, I hope all the participants have access to uh, a mobile phone or internet, right? So I just wanted to start with an un untraditional way, non-traditional way, my talk. I request you to please uh, let me first uh, share my screen. Yeah, can you all see my screen? Yes, yes, can. Yeah. So I request you to go to our oh, okay. Um, that's um, Yeah, so I request now you can see my PPT, right? PowerPoint. Yes, yes, we can see. Yes. So uh, please go to this menti.com and there it will ask you to enter your code. Please enter this code 76614563. Let me know if it is not working. Purnima, is it working? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing it after it. Yeah. We can scan it with a camera itself, right? You can also scan, yes. Or you can manually enter this code. Is it working? Yes. Okay, so now I will uh, stop. I will see the other one. Okay, this should be your uh, response, but I don't see any response for now. Okay, participants, have you scanned that? It's okay if it is uh, if you are having problems in accessing this code. No, no, it is open now. I can see what do you think is the central driver of uh -huh. biodiversity. Yeah. Oh, from oh, this is a uh, the question, and we have to see the screen, and we have to answer it, right? No, no, you can just answer on your mobile phone. You don't have to okay. see at the screen. Okay. You see the question yet? Okay. What question do you see now? What do you think is the central driver of driver of biodiversity? Okay. Options: humans, flora and fauna, unknown factors. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. I see one humans. How many we have? Ten participants. Only one participated. <laughs> It's fine. So the idea is to warm you up for the uh, session. This also should give me an idea of uh, where you stand in respect to, uh, there is actually another question I wanted to ask, but it looks like uh, you guys have problem in uh, uh, responding, but let me directly go to the talk then. Yes. Now you see, you should see my presentation hopefully. Yes, yes, get it. Yes. So this is the presentation. So um, what I try to what I try to do today is briefly introduce you to uh, bio what is biodiversity and what is its importance. I think for this audience, because you already uh, came uh, to attend this session, I'm sure you are already more than uh, uh, aware of this topic. So I will not spend a lot of time on this. I will then explain uh, briefly about the RNA and its role in biology. And then I'll try to go to present you uh, what is the um, uh, perceived role of RNA in the origin of life, and then what is the impact of uh, RNA's ecological RNA on the ecological impact. And then also I try to give some present some case studies uh, on success stories where RNA interference or RNA has been successfully used for biological uh, diversity 
and uh, then i will also try uh, try to present my uh, perspectives on uh, future of uh, rna technology uh, in biodiversity and general and in general in the medicine biomedicine and i try to also speak briefly about opportunities for students uh, future opportunities for students in uh, rna research and um, at the at the end of the presentation i am also happy to take uh, your questions uh, related to the topic and my presentation and i am also happy if you should have any questions related career related questions if you would like to ask me how to uh, about research and uh, development in germany for example and so on so let me then um, uh, start straight away uh, i mean biodiversity we all know what is the definition of it so i don't want to repeat it here but i wanted to emphasize on uh, different levels of uh, biodiversity one can think of right so there is a uh, species uh, level diversity in a given ecosystem and there is uh, ecological diversity so in a given uh, 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 habitat one can find different uh, ecosystems and uh, and then all of this are based on genetic diversity uh, species level diversity uh, uh, and uh, gen uh, general level diversity and so on and it to all of this eventually leads to a global diversity right so then what is the importance of it and why we should uh, understand about this and why we should try to conserve this so uh, biodiversity is the basis for uh, providing food water and all other resources for us biodiversity is uh, very important for uh, climate reg climate regulation right for uh, uh, rains and timely rains or uh, temperature control and so on then uh, biodiversity um, uh, because of this biodiversity the uh, different uh, flora or fauna are present in this uh, ecosystem we also get many natural medicines which some of them we might even not be aware of right and uh, such biological diversity in a given uh, habitat also attracts uh, tourists both national and international and that is also source of uh, uh, income for a uh, given administration in the region and all, all in all, I would say that uh, biodiversity is really essential for our own uh, uh, survival, right? Um, it, it, it will facilitate uh, 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 comfortable uh, well-being of humans in the given system. So this is the importance of uh, biodiversity. And then why are we talking about RNA in the context of uh, biodiversity? I try to briefly explain here. So, uh, so here I show uh, simply a cell. Uh, it can be also nucleus inside the cell. So we all know this central dogma of uh, molecular biology, or some people also call it as the central dogma of life, right? So from the DNA, uh, in a, uh, through a process called uh, transcription, uh, RNA is uh, synthesized, and from RNA with the process of with the process called translation, protein is is synthesized. As you can see already here, uh, let me get the, yeah. as you can see already here, so DNA is a double standard. I think most of us already know it. And um, RNA is a single standard mostly, but protein, we have uh, different uh, uh, structural forms uh, from the uh, primary to all the way to the tertiary structure, right? So within DNA, we also have epigenome. Some people call it as epigenome or it is part of uh, the genetic material, but this is the broad uh, sense of uh, uh, molecular biology or life, what we are aware of. But in recent years, it's not only, uh, so RNA, what we know usually is about messenger RNAs, right? Messenger RNAs are coding for protein and uh, through the translation process, they, they give rise to proteins. But there is a huge part of uh, non-coding genome. Uh, which is around 90% of the uh, 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 codable uh, trans transcribed uh, genome. And within this non-coding part, non-coding RNAs, there are several uh, uh, RNAs known. So for example, micro RNAs, there is ribosomal RNA, there is long non-coding RNA, there is small nuclear RNA, circular RNA, and so on. So out of these, maybe we are all aware of uh, some names already, right? For example, ribosomal RNA, we know what it means, what is the importance of it in, in the translation, right? Um, uh, uh, at the same time, like uh, small nuclear RS, these are these are for the genome integrity and stability in the uh, nucleus, nucleolar, and so on. But for example, microRNA, so they don't have any specific function as uh, at least known function until very recently. So what we know now is microRNAs, they don't code for any protein because they are very small in size. 
um, about 25 nucleotides, but they they uh, uh, perform a very different function. So, which I will talk about uh, in later slides towards end of the lecture. But the idea here is so this is the RNA and its role in biology. So RNA is really uh, 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 transferring the information from DNA through RNA basically to form a protein. If there was no RNA, there is no protein formed, and RNA other than uh, uh, functioning as a protein uh, coding molecule, RNA has also diverse functions. I try to explain here in, in the form of non-coding RNAs. And then, um, uh, oh yeah, we already come to uh, what is the RNA world hypothesis, right? So we, we all have different hypotheses, how the universe has formed and uh, we have different, uh, some are uh, experimentally proven, or uh, close to be proven and some are theories. And one of such uh, hypotheses is uh, RNA world hypothesis. So what it tells is uh, the whole world, uh, the, the life has originated from a single uh, molecule, right? Single RNA molecule. Uh, the, the concepts in support to this uh, hypothesis is uh, RNA itself can store uh, genetic information like DNA does. And uh, RNA can uh, independently catalyze chemical reactions without any accessory proteins, right? So that's where they are called as ribozymes. And this was awarded Nobel Prize in 1989 uh, for the discovery of ribosomes. Actually, in fact, the, the Nobel Prize to ribosomes has fueled the uh, uh, belief in uh, uh, RNA world hypothesis. And RNA can self-replicate. Of course, for this process, it needs some uh, assistance in form of accessory proteins and so on. So um, it can plausibly also synthesize RNA nucleotides under uh, prebiotic conditions. So uh, if you just have one nucleotide uh, under certain controlled chemical uh, conditions, reactions, it can also give rise to RNA sequence, right? And then uh, ribosomes, uh, if you can recollect the mechanism of ribosomes, how they uh, code for protein sequences. So ribosomes are composed of also RNA molecules. We have 16S and 18S uh, RNAs in there, right? So RNA is a basically integral part of uh, protein uh, translation when the protein is formed. And it, it also has enzymatic function. So this this all these uh, discoveries have led to the hypothesis that maybe the whole um, life has originated from single RNA molecule. But there are also equal number of uh, arguments against this hypothesis, because uh, how we, we still don't know so, uh, answers for uh, several questions. For example, uh, how uh, RNA first molecule uh, would have originated from non-living uh, matter, and how what is the ability of RNA molecules to self-replicate, how they are doing. We know they are doing, but we don't know how uh, strong and how what is the mechanism behind that, and uh, how a, a single RNA molecule would have evol um, evolved into a DNA or proteins eventually, and what were the first cells look like? We don't have a experimental proof, laboratory proof for that. And uh, again, what was the source of energy for initial RNA molecule uh, uh, replication and uh, expansion and so on? So these are open questions. But um, uh, so this is, I, I would say that uh, uh, from my understanding, this is still ongo ongoing debate. Nobody rules out RNA world hypothesis, right? Uh, but uh, there are also uh, equal number of uh, arguments against this, especially because there are also other viable hypotheses to explain the origin of life. But in this slide, I wanted to give you an impression of the importance of RNA and how it would have uh, or, uh, led to origin of life. Uh, in the uh, uh, in the historic ages, the prehistoric ages. So um, yeah, then let's talk about uh, RNA's ecological impact. Uh, how uh, it can impact different species in an ecosystem. Uh, so um, you might have uh, you might be aware of uh, environmental uh, DNA, right? So the environmental DNA. Uh, I don't want to talk a lot about that because the topic is about RNA today, but the idea here is uh, why environmental RNA is superior or why studying eRNA is superior than uh, to studying eDNA, right? So basically uh, um, what uh, researchers or what scientists use e environmental DNA for is to, because DNA is its extraordinary power of uh, being uh, conserved like even for several centuries, right? So one can isolate DNA from even fossils, dinosaurs, and so on. So 
So from there, we could get a clue of how the life would have been in that uh, ages when dinosaurs were alive, for example. Uh, that is the uh, um, strength of uh, environmental DNA. But why we should now think of uh, environmental RNA instead of DNA is, RNA, I just I tried listing out some of the points here. So RNA is more sensitive than traditional methods. So traditional methods, here I meant uh, environmental DNA uh, isolation method. Because uh, for the same reason, uh, what is the strength of eDNA that it can be uh, preserved for several uh, centuries, whereas RNA is not, it is more sensitive, right? So this is also then that, that also makes it more um, uh, uh, plausible uh, target to study living organisms, right? Because RNA is found only in living cells. Imagine in a given habitat, you get you found some uh, DNA that is of some new species in which is not known. Then you are not sure whether you will not be able to differentiate whether that DNA is from an extinct uh, organism which used to live there, or it is from a current uh, uh, living uh, organism which is just roaming around. We we will not be able to differentiate that with environmental DNA. That's where environmental RNA come into picture because RNA is found only in living cells and it is also um, less invasive, right? Because uh, even in your uh, uh, breath and uh, uh, RNA can be found. So RNA and RNA this can be found, can be detected. So if you detect some uh, fresh RNA in, in a given environment, that is an indication of living uh, organisms uh, around in that uh, habitat, right? In that environment. So that is the biggest, uh, um, uh, application of uh, RNA, we get biggest use. And uh, coming to some applications, basically it is used to detect uh, pollutants in a given environment. Imagine um, there is uh, some wheat growing in a, in a, in a uh, given crop, and uh, we don't know what that wheat is. And then in this case, RNA detection of RNA and analyzing the RNA would be uh, more uh, sensitive, sensitive, sensitive method and more applicable method. And also RNA is also used for, to track the uh, spread of diseases. I mean, we all know in the case of uh, COVID a uh, couple of years back, how um, um, uh, how we used RNA-based uh, uh, methods, right, for developing uh, vaccination against COVID-99 and also to detect uh, RNA in a given patient sample. So in fact, uh, people have also developed uh, ways to, to uh, analyze uh, uh, seaways uh, samples, right, for RNA, and then uh, predict the spread of COVID-19 in that given uh, uh, area, given locality, and so on. So that is the strength of analyzing environmental RNA. And then uh, we can also use uh, RNA, environmental RNA, to assess the health of uh, ecosystem. So, uh, we all know if we have a reference uh, genome and how the hell, how we, if we all know how the hell, how should the healthy RNA look. And if you um, uh, take a sample from a disease plant or disease, disease organism, you can easily detect where is the uh, what is wrong and uh, what what could be the cure for that. So this is the strength of this is the use of uh, analyzing environmental RNA. Uh, then I would like to briefly also go through the methods what we all uh, we can use to um, uh, basically to understand or to study RNA in the bio in biodiversity. So uh, very widely used method nowadays and also very cost effective method methods by now. I mean ten years back because I'm working on this RNA for last twenty years or so. So I know the how the price per sample is decreasing over years, right? That is simply because of uh, advancements in uh, uh, methodology, in techniques, and uh, the advancement of the kind of required material we need, right? The required RNA to analyze uh, uh, a whole organism, basically. So uh, a decade or one and a half decade ago, I still remember, I had to um, basically collect a lot of uh, tissue samples, even from patients, to get enough RNA to, to, to measure enough RNA signature in there. But now I can do the same with simply one nanogram of RNA, right? We can do that. We have such a sensitive methods available. And RNA sequencing, again, it is we have uh, uh, many um, uh, uh, variants in there, but broadly it's called as RNA sequencing, short read length, long read length, and so on. And then we have CRISPR-Cas9-based uh, gene editing. So this is another um, 
um, Nobel Prize winning uh, discovery in the RNA field. I think in 2019 or 2020, uh, the scientists who discovered this uh, CRISPR Cas9 system, subgene editing, have been awarded the uh, Nobel Prize in uh, medicine. So this is basically imagine you have a um, uh, gene that is uh, 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 damaged or uh, there is a single uh, uh, strand break or double strand break. Um, that And you know that gene is causing the uh, 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 disease, right? Monogenic diseases. And then uh, by targeting, by using this method, you can uh, specifically target that particular gene and without uh, less off-target effects because off-target effects are the biggest problem in genome editing or genome medicine. So CRISPR-Cas9 -Cas method based methods are uh, very well uh, studied, being well studied by now. Uh, there are also many clinical trials going on for this. And we also have RNA interference. So this is uh, my my all my studies, my PhD and the prior studies for the RNA interference. So here basically we are using uh, external um, uh, externally delivered uh, small interfering RNAs, for example, or small um, uh, hairpin uh, RNAs or even micro RNAs, right? So we are delivering them into the system to repair. Uh, in this case, we are not repairing, but we are basically um, either replacing the the damaged gene. We are basically synthesizing healthy uh, protein, or by um, uh, deleting or by knocking it down via siRNA or shRNA. Right. So, uh, if if a particular protein is highly expressed in a in a disease, we are with the RNA interference. We are trying to um, uh, reduce its synthesis or um, uh, degrade it via uh, risk conflicts and so on. And then uh, very well, uh, very well uh, 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 utilized methodology is RNA vaccination for COVID-19. Um, we all know how the, it saved the world from um, uh, COVID uh, pandemic, right? COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, of course, we also have uh, other uh, uh, um, uh, corona vaccinations, right? Not RNA-based, but uh, based on a uh, whole uh, attenuated uh, viral uh, sequence and so on. But at least in the Western world, we uh, uh, here we, we all had the RNA-based vaccination against COVID-19 and it is highly successful. So, and now based on the, I mean, field are stimulated by the success. Now many companies and many academic laboratories are working on developing uh, RNA vaccinations against many other diseases, uh, many even, even, even against cancer, right, multigenome. Uh, multi-gene uh, based uh, uh, diseases like cancer or even uh, Parkinson's disease, neurological conditions and so on. So these are the broad techniques that are used. And uh, again, we also use um, many techniques like amplification of uh, RNA sequence, right? Uh, via quantitative real-time PCR. These are basic methods used in the laboratory. But what I try to highlight here are the uh, at the uh, ecolo at the uh, biodiversity level, right, ecological level, where we can apply them as a uh, mass source, uh, basically high throughput methodologies. So then I try to give some um, uh, uh, practical examples where uh, scientists have used successfully um, as either as a proof of concept or even successfully implemented, right. For example, in Australia, protection of uh, um, uh, coral reefs from this uh, starfish called uh, crown of thorns starfish, uh, briefly called as cods. So this is a uh, native uh, coral predator. So when they invade the corals, they um, basically they infest them and uh, the corals will not be healthy anymore and it will be a big problem. So um, uh, it will cause significant damage to the coral reef. And usual uh, methods, uh, classical methods used are basically either culling, that means uh, manual removal of these uh, starfishes by uh, um, divers or even uh, by employing some uh, me mechanical techniques, right? Or uh, some biological controls with sea slugs or crabs by delivering some other organisms which can basically uh, live on these starfishes so that the, the population of uh, starfishes, these cods are less or environmental management basically to uh, yeah also again either culling or biological control but do them frequently so that the coral reefs are free of these spots but 
very recently, I think in 2018-19 times, um, uh, uh, scientists have, um, what they did was basically they um, uh, genetically modified uh, these cords by using RNA interference uh, technique by which these cords are not able to secrete that uh, poisonous venom anymore because that gene that is responsible to, to, to secrete that poisonous venom in this cord has, has been uh, deleted in this carcasses. But they are otherwise viable and they are happy, they are healthy, except not secreting this venom. So this has very far-fetching applications, right? Not only in the protection of uh, coral reefs, also basically if we can apply this uh, technique, um, we can actually um, uh, let the organisms live, poisonous organisms live in the ecosystem without reducing their population. They can still happily live around, but they don't cause problem to other um, organisms. So this is uh, taken as, a, uh, this is seen as very, um, uh, an application or a proof of principle uh, application with very uh, wide range of applications in, in many other uh, fields, not only for uh, biodiversity. Um, another uh, uh, newer example in this uh, field is RNA vaccinations to protect uh, endangered, endangered species from disease, right? For example, I'm showing an African elephant here. So anthrax is a deadly disease, right? Uh, we are all aware of that. And it is called by this um, um, bacteria called uh, Bacillus anthra um, anthracis. And it is transmitted through basically physical contact via animals. So, and uh, it is even more bigger threat to, to um, uh, African elephants and uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, elephants have been found dead because of this infection. So, um, uh, I mean, uh, classical methods of applying antibiotics against uh, bacteria and so on, they, they are working up to a certain extent, but obviously they are not uh, uh, completely useful, right? To, because because of the requirement of highest doses required and high costs involved and so on. That's why people now uh, are um, looking towards um, uh, RNA-based vaccination. This, uh, the initial trials have been very promising. It is even before uh, COVID uh, vaccination, if I'm not wrong. So um, basically what they did was they designed a targeted vaccine against the gene that is responsible for producing uh, um, this uh, survival of anthrax uh, bacteria. And uh, then the positive side of well, the positive of the impact of using RNA vaccination is like COVID vaccination. Basically, it is uh, it has long lasting uh, uh, protection. It is safe. It is highly effective, and uh, it is sustainable. Right? Because once it is working, you can easily scale it up without damaging any other ecosystem, any other organism to produce. Let's say antibiotic or anything, right? So it can be completely done in situ in the in in the laboratory. So it is sustainable and uh, more ethical way of uh, you know controlling the pest. So this method is simply also can be applicable to um, the plant ecosystems where we have um, weeds, right? Resistant weeds. We all have pesticides and the chemicals to kill the weeds, but uh, these pesticides we are not specific to that weed, right? If the, depending on the the way of application, you can also lose your crop. So imagine we can do genetic engineering, RNA-based genetic engineering in those plants um, that uh, maybe we can reduce their growth or they, we can reduce the impact of those weeds on the um, uh, uh, primary crops, right? So this also has very uh, broader range of applications. And um, another example I wanted to live, uh, I want another live example or uh, success story I wanted to present is about using RNA as a uh, gene driver, right? So RNA-based uh, um, uh, gene drive is basically that uses RNA to drive the inheritance of a particular gene. So in this case, either, uh, for example, in the case of uh, um, uh, mosquitoes, right, who, uh, which spreads uh, malaria. So, um, I mean, people have, are, people have been using uh, different strategies. Basically, they were sterilizing uh, male uh, mosquitoes so that the 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 general next generations will not be there but these methods also proven to be uh, somehow these mosquitoes are highly intelligent they are very clever right they are developing resistance and then uh, the the offsprings uh, are not completely eradicated so that's where now um, uh, uh, scientists are using um, uh, rna based uh, rna based uh, 
methodologies basically to 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 uh, knock out that particular gene that is responsible for uh, 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 basically malaria spread right so it also has again very um, um, broad range of applications uh, i try to uh, show some here in this image so in agriculture in the pest management and also in the uh, protecting the threatened or uh, protecting or basically protecting human from the threatened species like in the previous example i mentioned um, and then um, uh, immunizing the animal uh, reservoirs, uh, basically, uh, some kinds of birds or monkeys, even for example, and uh, controlling vector borne diseases like uh, uh, mosquitoes we just talked about. So these are the very practical examples, basically cutting edge and live examples that are being developed at the moment. Um, now, um, I also wanted to give very, um, uh, this is really a live example, uh, very close to where I live, where I live in uh, Heidelberg. So Heidelberg is the headquarters for uh, European Molecular Biology Laboratories, EMBL. What they're doing is basically, they're basically um, uh, uh, conducting a kind of uh, uh, a program, it's called uh, TREC, I guess, yeah. So uh, traversing European coastlines. So idea of this is, so basically, they start uh, from uh, Germany here. Basically, then they go through all the European coastline that is possible uh, with a basically um, with a ship and everything uh, by road and whatnot, every means. And then they try to collect different um, uh, samples at each uh, point: uh, soil, uh, sediment, uh, sea water, the shallow water, model organisms, and uh, uh, model organisms at each uh, spot. And then they try to analyze them on really, really high throughput manner. Again, using um, RNA sequencing or genome sequencing methodologies. The idea is to understand the diversity, biological diversity of um, uh, different uh, organisms or different ecosystem in the European coastline. So this is really multi-million project called in, being done in collaboration with, uh, uh, basically this is lab on uh, track they call. Uh, it's a truck. It has all the facilities to do to perform sequencing or to perform high throughput imaging, uh, microscopy, and so on. So then uh, everything is done in real time, and everything is in real time transferred to EMBL uh, databases, and then it's being uh, analyzed with artificial intelligence based um, uh, ways. So basically, this is one of the huge uh, programs uh, ever done in the history. So uh, everybody is very eager to know what comes out of it. So it, it just started, I think, uh, last year. It's still going on, and it is expected to end uh, uh, go until next year. So that's it. And before that, uh, they also conducted like a pilot project for this, and it was highly successful. So now, based on the reasons from the pilot project, now they are expanding into whole Europe. So um, yeah. So I uh, hope it is clear. Are there any questions until now? Happy to take your questions. Or I we can also talk about, we, we can also um, discuss at the end of the presentation. So now I briefly want to touch upon um, the future of uh, RNA technology, right? How it is applicable, how it can be applied to biodiversity conservation, biodiversity and ecological conservation. So I bring up on the same slide what we have seen before. So as I already explained, so there are basically many uh, non-coding RNA species, and one of them is this micro RNA. So, MicroRNAs are basically um, very short sequences when compared to messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is the one which is uh, directly coding for a protein sequence, right? And it is usually several kilo base pairs in length, at least uh, 500 base pairs up to 5, 10 kilo base pairs or 10,000 base pairs in length. In comparison, microRNA is only maximum 25 nucleotides in length. That means it's very short, but it has this huge capacity of binding to an RNA, uh, binding the RNA sequence, and then degrading it so that the protein is not produced anymore, right? That means it is not directly translating into the protein, but it is regulating the protein expression by directly binding to its corresponding mRNA sequence, messenger RNA sequence. So again, this has been discovered very recently, only let's say uh, uh, towards the beginning of 21st century, I would say, and its functionality has been also studied, very well studied, how it is functioning and so on. But now what people, including uh, we in uh, Heidelberg, what we're trying to do is to use this as a uh, therapeutic target to, to treat a basically disease, right? 
Uh, I briefly explained about monogenic diseases where one gene is responsible for causing a disease, right? Uh, in that case, yes, where if you have, if you know that particular mRNA particular gene is responsible, it is very easy to basically target that gene and maybe reverse the disease phenotype. But imagine cancer or the neurological condition, uh, condition right? The Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, and so on. This is not monogenic. The many disease, many genes are involved. Uh, at least uh, uh, double number of double digit number of uh, RNA or genes are involved in the progression or the sustaining sustaining the disease. If you target only one gene, that is not possible to uh, reverse the disease phenotype, right? Or at least cure the disease. If they, in that case, what you have to do is uh, then basically target multiple RNAs in one go, right? Then that will increase the uh, payload of your uh, uh, targeting sequences and it will lead to off-target effects and so on. So that's where microRNAs come into play. So here I try to um, uh, annotate it. So imagine in a given disease, I'm not taking any names, any disease names here because it's work in progress in our group. So basically imagine there are uh, five genes that are all involved in a disease progression, right? In a classical scenario where you want to target uh, a messenger RNA, then you have to design five different sequences that would target uh, specifically to these five different genes and then somehow release into that specific cell where, for example, in the neuron or in a cardiac cell or so on. But microRNA, what it does is, so um, micro one particular microRNA, the unique property of microRNA is with this guide sequence um, where you can see it is binding to the gene, it can bind to any gene that has the sequence uh, similarity, right? Imagine now we identify, we can discover a microRNA that has this sequence similarity with all five disease causing genes. In this case, then we don't have to have go with five different mRNA targeting sequences, but we can simply go with one microRNA. Now I'm calling it as microRNA X here, and then it can go on bind. What will happen is then eventually all these disease causing genes will be uh, degraded and thereby the protein is not synthesized anymore, then hopefully one can reverse the disease um, pathology, right? Depending on what stage we are targeting. So this is the very unique property of microRNA. That's why they're called as, um, uh, that's why they're called as um, um, master regulators, right? Because one microRNA is regulating the expression of multiple. I'm just showing five here, it can be also 10, 20. It all, um, the trick is to find that microRNA which has binding sequences and uh, um, controlling capacity of multiple disease causing genes in a disease pathway. So now what we can do is basically we can design a microRNA inhibitor. Now I'm calling it as uh, ABC. Uh, uh, and then we can bind to that particular microRNA and the same thing can happen. So now the uh, microRNAs are degraded so that the protein expression is not uh, reduced anymore. So this it has uh, two sides of application, right? One, you can overexpress microRNA to reduce its protein expression. Other, you can reduce the expression of microRNA so that the target proteins are protected and they're not degraded anymore. So it has applications in both in those conditions where a particular, some genes are up or some genes are down, uh, down right? Um, in, a, in a multiple uh, complex pathway systems. So with the microRNA, one can basically target both upregulated and downregulated uh, sequences. That's the beauty of it. And with only one sequence that is in uh, maximum 20 nucleotides in, in length. And one example I'm showing here is uh, uh, in the pain, in the chronic pain. Uh, so pain is um, basically, uh, just briefly, so if we have pain, that is basically protective, right? Uh, we don't want to not have the pain. Having pain sensation is important. But in some patients where imagine a cancer patient, cancer survivor, or a patient who has accident, but um, the nerves are damaged, peripheral nerves are damaged, or a diabetic patient where there is a peripheral uh, neuropathy and nerves are damaged. So in these patients, what uh, uh, we frequently observe is there is a lot of ongoing, very problematic, excruciating ongoing pain uh, uh, happening. And the current medications are not able to um, treat or uh, address those problems, especially in the cancer survival. So um, then um, uh, obviously uh, chronic pain because uh, it is associated with some major disease uh, and also itself is a disease, right? My chronic pain, it is not monogenic uh, disease. It is caused by multiple genes. 
in this case what we did was so for example imagine in a healthy um, uh, a cell healthy neuron we have certain number of microRNAs so I'm showing only four here and the uh, cell uh, membrane it has integral um, it has um, uh, integral membrane proteins in tumor conditions what happens in the neuron so tumor is now not in on the neuron it's somewhere else on the bone or somewhere but but because of tumor micron environment and its influence on the neuron so neuron in the within the neuron the um, uh, number of microRNAs are increasing and that is leading to degradation of the cell membrane right and that is causing to increase pain uh, this is what we observe but if now if i come with a microRNA inhibitor I can deliver into the cell and now I can basically reduce the increased number of microRNAs and uh, thereby basically come into the physiological state and also it will also repair the cell membrane and restore all the proteins because now the protein uh, degradation through microRNA is not happening anymore. So we can also restore the membrane function and now the animals have normal pain. So this we have shown in as a proof of concept in animals. We are now trying to take it to the next level in the, in the clinic and so on. So, um, yeah, that I would see this as the future of uh, RNA uh, technology. Imagine now you can apply so all the methods I explained about, right? All the applications in the in the African wild uh, elephants or the uh, or the um, uh, control of the pests or even that this uh, star fishes that are invading the corals and so on. So there, imagine they were targeting only one messenger RNA with uh, that is causing the disease. If micro RNAs, if we can target a couple of uh, three, four messenger RNAs that are either secreting the venom or the toxic substances, we can control that. That would be the beauty of it, right? So we are basically getting a tenfold impact by same application, same quantity, and lesser basically more potent ways. So now I try to briefly uh, touch up on um, uh, possibilities. I mean, the ripple effect, I call it ripple effect because it is basically originating at one point, then it is diverging outward, right? Uh, so imagine now we are at the time, at the time point where the RNA evolution has started. So it may be in last five years or so, it is basically multi multifolding every month or every week, I would say. So what, how the students can um, uh, exploit this uh, golden era of RNA and uh, how they can build up their career. So as I explained already, this RNA interference technology it has enormous implications. Uh, let it be micro RNA based or small interfering RNA based or small um, um, hairpin RNA based or any based CRISPR Cas9 based method. So uh, it is very, um, whoever, whoever the student in biology or medicine or studying ecology and something, uh, all the biology or biomedical recent uh, related students, understanding this methodology and how it works as possible, get hands-on experience on this will be highly uh, useful. And in case whoever is not very inclined to working on the, in the wet lab or hands-on with RNA, they can also work on the dry lab, right? So in silico approaches, uh, bioinformatics and computational biology, the field is in huge need of such experts in future. So we we, we have difficulties finding a student or employee, right, uh, with such um, uh, experience. So this is also, this will also have very good prospects for the students. Then um, basically through the bioinformatics or computational biology, uh, developing own algorithms to understand the biological systems or ecosystems or biodiversity and so on, right? So basically, these are the basic, uh, I would call them bricks. Once you have them, you can construct whatever you want. You can construct a single room or big house or big castle or whatever. So understanding that is really important. Then there is also the synthetic biology, right? So synthetic biology is simply, uh, for example, imagine you have uh, mRNA vaccination, successful vaccination, then um, scaling it up uh, in a, that is required for the whole world and so on and also design efficient ways to synthesize enough uh, messenger RNA vaccination. So this comes under uh, biotechnology slash synthetic biology. So getting knowledge in that field also highly useful. And then comes, uh, um, as I already explained, so, so viral and infectious diseases, and there is also cross-disciplinary opportunity. So once you are expert in RNA, because RNA biggest uh, uh, rate limiting step here is um understanding the dynamics of RNA, right? How 
because if the RNA sequence is long, then it also can fold into its own, uh, can basically, uh, uh, can fold into different forms based on the self-complementary, right? If there are complementary sequences, it is also forming into uh, secondary, tertiary, uh, quaternary structures, but those terms are mostly used for proteins, but scientists know that RNA can also do that, that can also form into um, uh, different structures. So if you imagine if you are a physics uh, student, who is interested in uh, biology, right? Understanding the biodiversity and the conservation and uh, biological systems, you can apply your uh, bio uh, physiological or physics knowledge, understanding thermodynamics of RNA folding, how RNA uh, micro RNA interaction is happening, for example, or RNA small interfere RNA interactions, or how it is happening, how one can improve that, and so on, right? And uh, virology and infectious diseases, we all know, best example is COVID 9, how to COVID 19. How to use RNA-based therapeutics to um, uh, uh, to basically prevent the disease progression? But until now, still we don't have a proper treatment for COVID-19. Right? We are only trying to uh, prevent it by vaccination, RNA-based vaccines, or whatever. Uh, we are trying to prevent it, but we don't have good treatment still, unfortunately. So, but understanding uh, um, RNA um, mechanisms and RNA functionality will also help developing such um, uh, treatments. So yeah, with that, I already reached the uh, last slide and now I'm happy to take any questions. I hope I'm within my time for now. Thank you. Thank you, Kiran, for your uh, very nice and informative talk. And uh, now participants, uh, you can ask your questions. So we can interact and then we can get apart. We have done the done the finish. Oh. Yes. Any questions related to this talk or any questions related to your study further, how you take your career? Broad or something like that. Come on, participants. I'm happy to talk to you. I, I actually I was hoping to see you on video. <laughs> yeah, I can understand you don't want to have video on, but I'm happy to interact. I mean, feel free to ask anything. Uh, either with RNA, DNA, genomics, or career. I'm happy to. I, I still have some time. Happy to interact. That's what the most important part, right? I don't want it to be uh, one-way traffic. I would like to have two-way traffic. So, and Kiran, I should tell you that one of one of your one of the point uh, points that you have presented, right? To study mm -hmm. RNA-based uh, methods uh, uh, for bio biodiversity conservation. So you have to do one point. So that is that is uh, that was very interesting to me because it it is closely associated with our objective. So mm -hmm. I think I should explore more on that so we can associate more in future. Sure. Happy to happy to always my pleasure. Thank you. So we we can end up the session then, huh? Yes, Quigan. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you for Thank all you your much. efforts. Yeah, to make this uh, event happen. Thank you so much. Thank you.